So we start uh, the second day of the symposium with the key lecture, uh, which I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> um, I'm gonna mm, yeah. My name is Katerina Filuk. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Palermo, and um, today I want to. Uh, introduce you the contemporary Ukrainian photography and photo-related art practices in Ukraine. Because yesterday we were talking more about the, the Soviet period and then the, the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, today uh, we're gonna focus more uh, on the photographers who are still active. Uh, we're gonna uh, also uh, talk about different initiatives. Uh, and one of our presenters will uh, show us a book that is, uh, has been just printed, uh, the War Archive. So uh, today, in general, we will be talking more about contemporary photography and before uh, Ukrainian photography. And before I start, uh, since we had this conversation yesterday and we touched upon the um, education in photography, I thought that I should uh, uh, give this very brief overview of uh, what is the situation uh, in Ukraine uh, in this respect. So as we mentioned many times yesterday, there is Viktor Marushinko School established in 2004 and active, uh, still active. Uh, it's an NGO, it's a private, uh, private institution. Uh, there is, there was a uh, bird in flight school active in 2016 and 2020, uh, and the website which was specialized in um, uh, articles about Ukrainian photography. Uh, both, I assume, are on pol uh, on hold uh, since 2020, and the website since 2022. Uh, there is MIF, uh, Mikolaev Young Photographers School, established in 2011 uh, in Mikolaev by Sergei Milnichenko. Uh, and it's also a private institution. And we see already uh, sort of a new generation of photographers trained in this school uh, and quite actively exhibiting and uh, uh, taking part in, in various uh, photo contests uh, in Europe and in Ukraine. Um, there was a photo fair called Photo Kiev established in 2017 uh, and the last edition was in 2022. Uh, again, private initiative. Um, the magazines that uh, that we already mentioned yesterday, uh, 5.6, and then the, another one called Salute, established in 2021, and the, so far there are two issues. Uh, one was on female photographers, the first one, and the second one uh, about the, the 90s, and you see the covers of the 90s issue over there. Um, there is a website called Untitled, established in 2020, where some uh, profiles of, of Ukrainian photographers can be found and some articles. As far as, it, as I know, is still active. And uh, then there is a, a Ukrainian photographic alternative, uh, UFA, established in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, and then they published a huge compendium, which I'm sure some of the colleagues uh, saw, the big pink book, uh, featuring uh, 57 uh, photographers and 82 projects, all Ukrainian photographers. It's called uh, uh, UFA Made in Ukraine. Uh, so anyone interested in Ukrainian photographers, uh, I encourage you uh, to look for this uh, book. It's uh, bilingual, Ukrainian and English. 
Um, there is an online platform, Ukrainian uh, Photographies, and uh, Max Gerbatsky will tell us more about this initiative later today. And then when we talk about education, um, the National Academy of Visual Arts and Architecture in Kyiv uh, doesn't have a photography department, but there is a department called uh, multi Multimedia and Visual Arts, and uh, there there is a course on photography which is uh, pretty short, but nevertheless it's there. Uh, then there is a course on photography uh, which is called Education and Professional Program Photography um, at Kyiv National University of Theatre, Cinema and Television, named after Karpenka Kari. And uh, Kharkiv, I think not, uh, uh, not least because of the Kharkiv School of Photography, have, has two uh, educational programs in photography. So it's both uh, Kharkiv Academy of Culture uh, and Kharkiv State Academy of Arts, uh, where respectively there is a program photography and videography and photography and visual practices. So this is a little bit uh, maybe not what I wanted to talk and I will talk uh, in my presentation, but to sum up uh, in a way the conversations that we had yesterday and give a better idea of how photography is integrated in educational uh, programs and what are the initiatives. And, and, and I haven't, managed, uh, haven't mentioned, excuse me, Odessa Photo Days Festival, and uh, we will also hear more about it from uh, Katerina Radchenko uh, later today. Um, so going back to, to the topic that I selected, first of all, the title. Uh, so it's kind of borrowed from a famous book, uh, Beyond Memory, Soviet uh, Nonconformist Photography and Photo-Related Works of Art, uh, which uh, was uh, published uh, um, in the United States, and it deals with the Soviet uh, art collection, the, the biggest uh, collection of nonconformist art uh, outside of the Soviet Union by uh, Dodge. Um, and it's in a Zimmerli Museum uh, in the United States. And uh, I wanted to uh, highlight this aspect of like photo-related works of art, because yesterday we were talking more about photojournalism and uh, documentary, uh, and also we mentioned the fact that photography is somehow not really integrated into the uh, bigger uh, visual arts and uh, contemporary arts uh, ecosystem and still holds this very marginal status. Um, although, of course, recently more and more curators uh, include uh, photographs in, in the exhibitions uh, alongside um, installations and paintings and uh, sculptures. Uh, so, I would like to focus on the practices uh, in my presentation that are uh, more inclined, let's say, to the artistic works. So, these are the photographers who use, uh, or artists, we could say, who use photography as their main medium, and I would love to see them uh, this way, rather than have this division that these are the uh, the, the painters, the, the real artists, and these are the photographers who are kind of outsiders. Um, and then I was uh, also thinking, could it be productive to apply the, since yesterday we also were talking about different isms, uh, postmodernism and modernism, uh, would it be uh, useful to apply the, this term uh, which emerged emerged, let's say, in um, 2014 as the book Post Photography, uh, The Artist with a Camera by Robert Shore uh, was published. So can we apply uh, this approach, uh, this term post photography to the contemporary practices, um, photographic practices in Ukraine? 
And uh, when Shor talks about this uh, term, he uh, warns us that this shouldn't be uh, perceived as a movement, but rather as a moment uh, in the uh, history of photography. Or why? Because uh, the, uh, I, I, I quote here, one second. Uh, so, quote, uh, given an abundance of pre-existing visual material in our hyper-documented world, it's unsurprising that an increasing amount of photographic art begins with someone else's pictures. There is nothing new about appropriating found imagery uh, for fine art purposes, but the sources, methods, and goals are fast evolving. If digital culture has transformed photographic practice, that is how pictures are taken and displayed, it has had no less profound uh, an impact on how found materials are sought and then manipulated. So as you can assume, um, he uh, bases, let's say, this uh, post-photography uh, term on the idea of borrowed photographs. So as there are so many images around us, uh, photographers not necessarily have to produce their own images. They can already work with uh, what, they, uh, what they find. And uh, uh, excuse me, I lost the, yes. So it's, the, it's all about employing a greater variety of photographic techniques and styles and uh, to be more active in interpretation, appropriation, reenactment, staging, uh, transformative borrowing, um, and the uh, artist's interest in like intervening physically uh, uh, with the with the photographs uh, taken uh, by them or other people, um, and in this. Uh, Vain, I would like to show some of the projects. Um, I would love to show much more because there are uh, many interesting uh, projects which feel kind of uh, fall into, the, into this category of post photography, but uh, for the sake of time, we should focus on a couple of them. Um, and I will start with, uh, with this image uh, of. Uh, the project uh, by Sasha Kurmas, also mentioned yesterday a couple of times, um, which is from the series Red Horse. And uh, this is a series that um, uh, won uh, Grand Prix images uh, Vive in 2023-2024. Uh, which is uh, uh, the series is basically, as you can see, the pieces of cardboard where uh, Kurmas collages the images that uh, uh, the photos that he has taken in Ukraine uh, since 2022 with uh, some iconic images as you see here is the triumph of death and then with some personal notes um, and uh, the jury of the of the uh, the, the, the Grand Prix uh, uh, Vive, they actually uh, emphasized that this w it was what captured their attention and uh, this fragmented, uh, multi-layered approach uh, har characterizes also our reality, uh, which uh, in a situation of war gets also fragmented and uh, uh, there are bits and pieces that we uh, try to put together to somehow reflect on what's uh, going on. Uh, I have to say that Sasha Kurmas remained in uh, in Ukraine uh, um, and uh, documents uh, his life there, so it's also a very personal project. Um, and I think it could be, uh, yeah, would be considered the example of uh, post photography. Um, then we move on uh, to uh, Roman, Roman Petkovka's project, which is called Soviet Photo. 
Uh, Roman Petkovka is a photographer of, of a so-called second wave or the second generation of uh, Kharkiv School of Photography. Uh, you see here that uh, he applies the the sandwich uh, method uh, invented or introduced uh, by Boris Mikhailov. Uh, but uh, unlike Mikhailov, who actually worked with real slides, uh, he uses Photoshop in this case. And uh, he uh, juxtaposes two images. So the, the images from Soviet photo, the magazine that uh, was the only magazine uh, dealing with photography in the Soviet Union, and the nudes that he uh, has uh, taken. <laughs> and I would like to show you this one. I hope you remember this is the collage that we saw yesterday uh, in my presentation. And this, this is how um, Petkovka interpreted <laughs> this, uh, this collage. Uh, he says that uh, the work has been done in 2012, so it's not uh, the, the work that has, be, has been done during the Soviet times. And uh, he says that, <clears throat> of course, for, uh, for him, Soviet photo was a magazine representing communist propaganda. And there were bits and pieces of information that one could find uh, there about Western photography, for instance. But it, in general, this was something uh, that didn't find much respect or, or interest uh, from the um, photographers uh, working independently and uh, the members of um, Kharkiv School of Photography. Uh, so it's uh, for him is a way to rethink uh, and understand. Uh, how to how to deal with this legacy with uh, with the legacy of Soviet photo uh, nowadays, um, and uh, this uh, this project was also awarded by a Sony uh, World Photography uh, Award, um, recognizing uh, let's say the 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 importance of. Uh, of this kind of reflection on the past and uh, on uh, how this very monolithical uh, discourse could be lightened a little bit or uh, even broken with the means of, of photography, which of course is a bit playful, uh, a bit ironic, uh, but uh, reaches, I guess, uh, reaches the uh, goal and here we see also the author <laughs> who is uh, yeah uh, surrounded by by his photos. This is an exhibition uh, in Kiev at the Institute of Problems of uh, Contemporary Art. Uh, then I move on to the project uh, by. Uh, Sergei Milnichenko, which has a long uh, title. Let me find it. OK, so this is an, um, a kind of a play, very playful, uh, very funny project that uh, uh, plays with the idea of UFO photography. So, uh, as you as you can see at the beginning, uh, he found this guy guide uh, to the UFO photographers of how they are supposed to approach this uh, subject matter. Uh, what are the uh, what are the uh, basic rules uh, when you photograph uh, something uh, flying in the sky? Uh, and then he uh, made it a bit more uh, personal and, and subjective also because when you are dealing with something extraterrestrial, you also might reconsider your own uh, role and your own uh, place uh, as, a, as a human being uh, on the planet Earth. So it's, it, it is kind of an uh, introspection. It is kind of a 
questioning of uh, what is the meaning of life and what is the what is our uh, mission as human beings uh, here, uh, but also uh, packed in this very uh, humoristic uh, way. And uh, there was a book uh, published uh, which looked like uh, this yeah, uh, a silver silver envelope with a set of uh, posters and uh, photographs, and there are both uh, found images. Uh, there are these instructions and some drawings, and also photographs that uh, Milichenko took uh, himself, and then he c kind of mixed and uh, played with all this material, creating sort of a uh, reality that, uh, that doesn't, uh, doesn't really exist. Uh, and playing uh, with uh, with this idea of uh, photographing um, UFO, um, which I find uh, a very smart and very uh, beautiful way of uh, approaching uh, to the topic, but also, as I said, uh, a way to, to reflect on a very important, big uh, existential uh, questions. You see that, uh, yeah, there are also the photographs were also colored uh, afterwards, and there are some images uh, that have been taken uh, by Milichenko. And the next project is would be much better to see it uh, not as a reproduction, but uh, in real life, and I'll try maybe to show this one. I don't know if it's if it's possible to see. So these are the photographs taken by uh, Gerard Tomova. Uh, in 2015, so this is the uh, moment after the occupation of uh, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk region, and kind of uh, this feeling uh, of something that we didn't expect or we expect, but we hoped it's never going to happen. Um, and and then it happens and it ruins the the peaceful life it ruins our ruins our uh, perception of of uh, our life and uh, our uh, well-being uh, so the photographs are taken in kiev in a, um, in a residential area you see that they are kind of sublime very very simple very mundane scenes of uh, of uh, ordinary life but then she used the plexiglass, and uh, the plexiglass uh, is peered with, uh, with uh, bull bullets. So there are these bullet holes uh, that indicate that uh, kind of the, the, the normal life the, um, uh, has been interrupted, uh, disrupted uh, by the military uh, aggression of uh, a neighboring country. Uh, so back then, that was a reflection on the uh, occupation of uh, Donbass, of Crimea, uh, Donbass and Lugansk. Um, now it became became kind of a uh, yeah. A, a feeling that uh, every every Ukrainian uh, can uh, share and can uh, um, kind of confirm. And, and here we also see that uh, even though these are not the images, uh, uh, these are not the found images, these are the photographs taken by the photographer, then she uh, manipulates uh, the photographs, or rather she manipulates the way how the photographs are displayed uh, and adds a very important uh, layer, adds uh, a layer that basically creates this tension and creates this uh, meaning that we uh, easily can uh, can understand and uh, see. Uh, the next project is uh, by Anton Shibitko, 
and uh, you can see his uh, project, another project here at the exhibition in the in the art room. Uh, this is uh, so in general in his practice. Uh, he addresses the issues of the LGBTQ uh, plus community in Ukraine and spe more specifically gay community, which uh, of course uh, remains um, pretty uh, close and, and um, there are a lot of uh, threats from the t traditionalists or uh, right uh, uh, parties. Uh, who uh, um, are against, you know, this this kind of identity. Uh, so all of his projects, in one way or another, are touching upon uh, this uh, matter. And this one is called Common People. So these are the photographs that he was taking purposely or kind of stealing a photograph, uh, secretly photographing. Uh, people, and then manipulating uh, the results uh, so that you see some uh, became collages, uh, some are have these folds and wrinkles, uh, but the most important uh, uh, element, of course, is that these are meant to be portraits, and portraits uh, as, a, as a genre uh, uh, had this of very representative uh, function. So uh, also if we uh, look at the history of uh, photography, uh, there was a moment when there were this kind of small cards that uh, people were very, uh, it was very trendy and people really wanted to have their portraits to kind of use them <laughs> as business cards and to uh, exchange them and co collect them, uh, um, and it had a very important social function. While here we see that these people, they all cover their face. They, uh, they don't want to be recognized. They don't want to be seen because uh, there is still a, a huge stigma in the society when it comes to uh, th this uh, kind of identity, and uh, that's why Shebitko, respecting uh, the, the wishes of, of uh, and the privacy of uh, his uh, uh, protagonist, he photographs them in uh, this way, and then he manipulates with, uh, with the photographs. And this, uh, for instance, is how the installation looked like at uh, Mestetsky Arsenal, where it has been uh, shown. So uh, it also creates uh, this kind of cacophony of uh, uh, different people and different personalities that, uh, mm, however, uh, chose to be uh, concealed, cho chose to be uh, chose to hide because of the uh, how the society reacts. Uh, to them, uh, and these like teared apart uh, pieces of paper, they mm, I think visually represent this kind of uh, feeling uh, very well. The next project is by Yaroslav Solop, and he's also part of the <laughs> of the home uh, exhibition. Um, this is a project that he started in uh, 2012. It's called 11, excuse me. Uh, and it's called plastic mythology. So here, as a starting point, he takes the uh, Greek, uh, ancient Greek mythology, uh, and then uh, his uh, memories as a child related to these uh, Greek myths that uh, he uh, read as a uh, as a child, and uh, mixes them uh, with this. Uh, uh, modern synthetic uh, uh, plastic, let's say, elements, uh, of course, manipulating the original photographs, adding some elements, and uh, uh, commenting on the contemporary state of the society. So, the plastic mythology is the uh, is the title of the of the project. 
Um, the, these kind of ready-made works are characterized by the uncommon um, as to the classical mythological plot, interpretation of the pictorial elements, uh, their combination with nude bodies of uh, gods and Greek heroes, and the artistic uh, space. And the project involves uh, social context as it's name and sense are also about um, current uh, uh, frequently fake ideals of modern life uh, and about the external material uh, values. Uh, this is a project by <laughs> Max and Vic, I see that. <laughs> They are happy to see a lot of the artists they work with. This is a project by uh, Lia and Andriy Doslev, who are part of the Ukrainian pavilion in Venice this year. And it's called Black on uh, Prussian, uh, Prussian Blue. Uh, so this is a story uh, for these artists. They are, not, uh, they are not actually photographers. They do not uh, consider them photographers. They work with uh, very different mediums, installations, and sound, and um, textile. Uh, but uh, this particular project uh, deals with the found archive uh, of a a uh, family, family album of a Wehrmacht soldier uh, who uh, basically during the World War II crossed the, the entire continent, crossed Europe, and uh, <clears throat> took many photographs. And uh, they, they found this uh, abandoned archive, and uh, they, uh, while browsing through the archives, they noticed that while uh, in Western Europe he photographs some uh, sightseeing and landmarks and architecture, uh, what he photographs in Ukraine uh, is predominantly a very boring, very simple uh, landscape where the, uh, the black earth, the, uh, the soil uh, which Ukraine is famous for, uh, uh, occupies kind of the, the place, the main, the main role, occupies most of the, of the frame. Uh, so uh, they took these photographs, the, the photographs of the Ukrainian landscapes. Uh, they uh, used the projection of the photographs, then uh, painted over with the soil, with the Ukrainian soil, and then photographed the results. So there are a couple of stages of uh, uh, manipulations uh, in uh, this project. And at the beginning, uh, there is a... Uh, there is a uh, found uh, footage, found uh, photographs. Uh, so this is the result, what, what we see, this is the result, and this is the uh, exhibition uh, in Sherbenko Art Center in uh, Kiev. And alongside the uh, manipulated uh, works, uh, there were the, the, the real photographs from the archive, which uh, is not seen on this uh, exhibition shot, but uh, uh, they were also uh, on uh, on an opposite wall. And uh, I would like to finish this uh, very brief survey of uh, contemporary uh, photographic practices um, in Ukraine with the work of uh, Natalia Lubchenkova, uh, who is actually a journalist, uh, Ukrainian journalist, Living, uh, living in France, uh, and she chose the, her artistic uh, name as uh, Aliao. And what we see here is the uh, the works that uh, the photographs that she produced um, in uh, Solidar in 2021. Uh, during her residency uh, organized by Isolatia. Um, and for me, this, uh, these images, they have also a sentimental meaning because uh, uh, back then I worked with Izolace and that was the moment when the institution moved to Solidar, uh, which now uh, ra was raised to the ground. The, the city doesn't exist anymore. It's, uh, and all the 
inhabitants are um, elsewhere. They, they left the city. Uh, so uh, she photographed very typical uh, landscapes of the, of the area. Uh, and then she embroidered uh, on top of the, of the printed photographs. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and this, uh, this photographic uh, project found a very warm and very welcoming kind of uh, uh, feedback from the residents because uh, apparently, and this is something uh, which is part of the forgotten history of the region of uh, uh, Donbass and uh, Lugansk regions, uh, the embroidery was a very important uh, practice for the for the uh, local communities, um, and uh, uh, particularly this area was quite famous for uh, for the embroidery. But then it was all gone; it was all vanished by uh, by the uh, industrializa Soviet industrialization, and as well as all the traces of uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, who had been living uh, there for centuries. So uh, there is a beauty of the landscapes, uh, very simple, uh, very modest uh, landscapes, but there are also uh, these reflections about the, uh, the legacy and the past of uh, the region. Uh, there are, as I said, many more than uh, than that. The many more projects than that. Uh, I deliberately didn't touch on the that much on the didn't talk that much about the projects that uh, uh, deal with the current uh, war. Uh, although there are a couple of them that I mentioned. Um, yeah, and I wonder if uh, if this uh, definition. This post photography could could somehow be uh, useful for uh, Ukrainian photography, uh, or shall we just abandon this uh, desire to uh, to label everything and to give particular names? Because uh, what we find now in uh, Ukrainian contemporary photography is uh, uh, I, I would say it's very versatile. There are many. Uh, uh, approaches and styles, and uh, uh, people are really experimenting with the medium. So um, I wonder if if we should try to kind of unify this a little bit for the sake of the analysis, or uh, rather just try to take it as it is and look at this uh, uh, mul multiplicity um, and try to. Uh, yeah, enjoy, enjoy it. So I will stop here and I put up there all the websites of the photographers that I mentioned so that you can check other projects and uh, learn more. Thank you. I'm happy to answer the questions if there are any. <coughs> Um, yeah, I'm really interested in that in the categorization as well. And yeah. I was wondering um, whether you think, because a lot of uh, categorization of the last two centuries has been about the methodology of making rather than necessarily the um, intention of telling stories or commun the ways in which um, or the things that are being communicated. Mm -hmm. So I, I wondered how you felt about the relevance now of the sort of um, the isms, I suppose, um, given that so much of contemporary art uh, is sort of activist in some way, and, and you know um, there, there seems to be um, collections and ways of thinking about art which is is perhaps um, not connected to the methodology of making, but to the intention of the artist in terms of the real world rather than the art world. Yep, thank you. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, and I guess, uh, especially for, for academics, this, this is the question we start with uh, when we approach uh, any um, any project or any um, a particular photographer. Uh, what 
kind of attracted me in this idea of post photography that everyone who kind of talks about it uh, emphasizes that it's not a style, it's not a, a methodology, it's a, uh, it's not a historical moment, uh, um, as with all the isms uh, um, we know it happened. But it's more like, and I um, quote here, Catalan photographer uh, Joan uh, Fontocuberta, he said this is like a retouring of visual culture. So this is kind of what I like because it makes it um, kind of uh, wide enough uh, but then, as you said, maybe it's not that much about the, how the images were made, but although we were t I was talking about, you know, like uh, appropriating and uh, manipulating, etc. But, uh, yeah, about what, we, what the photographers are trying to achieve, what are their uh, intents behind using this or that particular uh, style or uh, approach. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a uh, new relationships, a new relationship uh, to to the images, and uh, that was. But this this is not something defined. I was rather trying to yeah suggest it as a as a uh, as an open uh, open end kind of a, <laughs> a question. Uh, as I'm not quite sure if this could work or uh, or not. Thank you, Katya, for your presentation. Um, as, as a person who is coming from more of a photojournalism background, um, it's not just about, about, like, uh, about gender, like it's like we are second day talking about Ukrainian photography and stuff. Um, in your view, where does um, war photography and photojournalism practices lay within contemporary Ukrainian photography in general? And um, let's say, uh, as an example, um, Evgeny Malaletka won World Press Photo, and uh, I heard from several photojournalists in the industry already that that project changing the game for photojournalism, how should be events like photographs or like in your country, and like it changes the game about insider, outsider perspective and things like that. So my question is like, where does all this war photography lace within contemporary Ukrainian photography? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a huge topic that, uh I hope uh, we will discuss a little bit in the last panel today. Um, we didn't really uh, delve into it, uh, in, into war photography, and I think it's, of course, I mean, clearly it's huge in Ukraine now. Um, so I try to focus on this more kind of artistic projects instead of talking about photojournalism and documentarity, uh, documentality, but of course it is, uh, it is a very important. And uh, as you said, I think uh, reportaging, uh, war reportage from Ukraine would change and is changing already the kind of the rules of the game a little bit. Uh, we still, I guess, need more time and uh, distance, maybe a little bit, to process it. Uh, I this morning I, I read uh, the, the news that Derskino, uh, uh, the organization that occupies uh, that uh, deals with uh, with cinematography in Ukraine, uh, got, uh, the imp wants to implement this program uh, on documenting war crimes and. Uh, this is clearly a, a manipulation, especially when it comes to future films, uh, because it's not a documentation of a, of, of, of a war. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a hot topic now in Ukraine. So obviously, this is like uh, the the buzzwords that that uh, that uh, they used to to get money from the from the government. Clearly, and uh, this is also another danger. I think that uh, there are so much produced already and uh, there are so many initiatives documenting on very different levels that then inevitably we would like we would need to have some kind of filters know how to how to deal with all this documentation and it's clear that there is this urge and there is this desire to document because this is a 
uh, a very particular experience that Ukrainian people are living through, and uh, they, uh, the, the contemporary technologies allow them to document things. Yeah, so it's very easy to take a photo or video. So this is a, another huge topic, and I think we need kind of another conference to <laughs> uh, to to talk about it. We are proceeding, and the next uh, is the panel discussion, uh, which uh, will be uh, a bit more practitioner speaking, I would say, uh, people who organize uh, exhibitions, uh, publish uh, books, and uh, have a first-hand experience with uh, Ukrainian uh, photographers. Um, I will briefly introduce the panelists and then I will uh, pass the floor to them. Uh, so each would have like 15 minutes to present and then uh, we can uh, have uh, a discussion and we are happy to take the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so our first speaker uh, would be David Elliott, uh, who uh, started work as a director of the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford in uh, 1976. Um, and uh, then he curated various exhibitions dealing with uh, Soviet, post-Soviet and uh, terrain. It's, um, for instance, early Soviet photographers. Um, and uh, photography in Russia in uh, from... Um, 1840 till 1940, which is also a publication, very difficult to get, <laughs> I confirm. Uh, and then he was a curator of the first Kiev uh, biennial uh, held in uh, Mestetsky Arsenal in uh, 2012. Uh, the next uh, speaker would be uh, Darius uh, Vajcikauskas, whom we had a pleasure to uh, hear uh, yesterday already. Uh, so I will skip the presentation because <laughs> we hopefully all know. Uh, I'll just say that he's an artist, curator, and publisher, publisher, and he extensively worked with Ukrainian uh, photographers, inviting them to Lithuania, but also uh, coming a lot to Ukraine. Um, I will, our next speaker, uh, is uh, Katerina Radchenko, who is a curator, artist, uh, and photography researcher uh, from Ukraine. And uh, she's a founder and director of the International Festival Odessa Photo Days, uh, established in 2015. And uh, in uh, 2023, she was a World Press Photo uh, Contest jury member. Um, in, then, uh, Max Grabatsky follows. Um, he is a curator and a researcher, currently curator at the Open Eye uh, Gallery, and also co-curator of the Ukrainian uh, pavilion uh, in uh, Venice Biennale. And uh, um, the last presenter is uh, Emine Zaitadinova, who is a um, Crimean Tatar documentary photographer and a co-founder of Ukrainian War Archive, uh, a digital photo archive of uh, Russia-Ukrainian, uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. Um, and she will talk precisely about uh, that today. Um, so um, we asked you uh, to uh, talk about or to think about uh, the challenges and the problems and the ways of uh, engaging with Ukrainian uh, photography. Uh, and each of you will present now uh, a project uh, you were working on or the projects you were working on. Uh, but I would like again to stress out to, and to encourage you to share your know-how a little bit and to share maybe some uh, tips uh, with other colleagues on how to, uh, how to approach this topic, given that uh, it's, uh, still, uh, there are still uh, lacking, like publications are lacking, 
some things are not in, in translated in English and that's less, less accessible. Um, some photographers also don't have websites, very banal, very simple <laughs> things, but somehow they affect how uh, curators and researchers deal with the with the subject. So uh, please uh, try to address that, and uh, we are uh, looking forward to hear your stories. And David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Got to be super quick. Um, okay, good. Uh, the reason I got involved with art in the first place. The reason. Hello. Yep. The reason I got involved with art in the first place was that um, I was interested in why it was historically so powerful. Having been born after World War II, I discovered as a quite young that uh, the Nazis hated modern art and they thought that it was degenerate. And they not only ignored it, but they tried to destroy it. And it became synonymous for them with communism and Judaism and everything else they didn't like. I thought, well, if that's decadence, if that's degenerate, I'm in for that. And that relationship between art and life and politics and ideology grabbed me and has stayed with me and continued to be with me ever since then. That's how I got involved in Russia. 1976, I was lucky enough to become director of the Museum of Modern Art. I started programming for myself. Uh, and Russia was one of the important things. The important show had taken place in 1972 in London, done by Camilla Gray, um, called Art and Revolution. And that was the first time work had ever came out of Russia, uh, of the constructivists, the Russian avant-garde. And I'd seen that, and it sort of, again, got me going. In 1977, I made a Lysitsky exhibition, 79, an Alexander Rodchenko exhibition, and then 82, an exhibition called Early Soviet Photography. By the time this took place, 1992, uh, we moved on. Soviet Union was moving on, it was just in the process of moving on. And it was possible to work on a, on a panoramic view of photography. So I want to really just show some images of Ukraine and Ukrainian artists, uh, photographers. This is Romulov. That's the full picture that you've just been looking at. Uh, sorry, Raoul, Raoul, Ivan Raoul. He uh, is actually French. We don't know what his dates. It's all very hazy, this early, early days of photography, the history of it. Podolsk, it's in Moscow, Ablast. It's a, it's a very taking painting. The place itself is very little interest. And then Odessa, the Odessa Steps, famous Odessa Steps. So he's showing picturesque people, uh, views, landmarks, and Josef Magirski, um, no dates for him either. What we do know is that he was Polish and he settled in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, this ancient Genoese photograph, so a, a landmark of that kind. Joseph Nordish, based in Kiev. Scenes of home life, God, looks miserable. Obviously the TV wasn't working that night. And again, local characters. And you see this replicated all over Russia. And in, in Russia, it being such a huge country, a huge empire, uh, it's providing for the first time images of, quote, real life for people to uh, app apprehend, to see. Um, not only of their back door, but of different classes of people, different regions, including Central Asia and, uh, and the far north. Then coming Nikolai Petrov, uh, this, um, this image is a really, a, you can see it's a, it's a bromide, uh, is the start of pictorialism. So we're moving from the early days of photography. I think it's much better if I stand here. Um, moving from the early days of photography into pictorialism. And you want more picturesque, and uh, of course the cliche of the uh, black earth, the harvests. And then something a bit more racy, the pictorialism from Odessa. Not so strong, it's mainly going over in uh, Petersburg and Moscow, that particular movement. Now, continuing that show, that was from um, 
1840 to 1940. I'm going to go to the show that we showed in 1982 that includes that last half of the show. Abram Sternberg, uh, born in Ukraine, Jewish, obviously. His brother was a very famous painter as well. And he bridged um, the kind of new, new photography with pictorialism, as you can see from that image. And there, much earlier, 1923, he was asked to do these two photographs of Vladimir Mayakovsky, Lilia Brick, by Alexander Rodchenko, because Rodchenko was working on a book of Mayakovsky's poem about Lilia Brick, his girlfriend, uh, called about this, and he wanted these pictures for the photo montage. After this, Rodchenko started making photographs himself. Semyon Friedeland, based in Kiev, uh, and it's not an image you see so often, actually. Uh, I think quite a lot of them were destroyed of the demolition of the, of the monasteries and the churches. Of course, as things went on, the five-year plan, Max Alpert, uh, the building of the Turksib Railway, born in Simfropol, and then over in Kazakhstan, and in 1936, a very important magazine has started being published in Moscow called SSR in Astroiki, uh, USSR in Construction. It was done in several languages, so in Russian and German, English, French. Uh, and this showed the new, the new Russia. And they had the best photographs, the best photogravure printing, and the best designers working on it. It was amazing. More of this, the Ghana Canal, another big project at that time. And then Boris Ignatovich. Ignatovich uh, was a close friend of, um, of Rodchenko, uh, worked with him. And in 1928, when Rodchenko was uh, kicked off the directorship of October um, magazine, because he was a formalist, Ignatovich took over. And um, he was uh, working in and out of Kiev. He made uh, the first photo art exhibition in the USSR in 1937 in, in Kiev. And he formed his own group called the Brigade Ignatovich, in which his wife and daughter <laughs> joined him. But they all came under that name. They were non anonymous. These are more typical constructivist type photographs. And then that classic image. More of the uh, five year plan and the, uh, the dam over the Rostov. And then this, Petrusov, lunch in the fields, uh, one year after the Great Famine had finished. Obviously a propaganda picture, uh, and a kind of horrible, sick joke, if you look at it. I mean, you know, happy peasants gathered around. I mean, Malievich and a number of other painters had it much more clearly, that they were painting peasants in the fields, but they had no faces. They had been removed. This is just a... A stage shot. By uh, 1999, uh, I was working in Stockholm uh, as director of Moderna Museet, and uh, uh, we decided that um, we'd do an exhibition to mark 10 years of the wall coming down. So there's 116 artists and artist groups from 33 countries of post-communist Europe, and then five of them were from Ukraine. This fast reaction group that you, uh, Elena was showing us yesterday, and they were supposed to be shown in this form. Uh, they didn't have the, um, uh, these folders to sort of preserve their modesty uh, with us. We showed them like that. As you can see, it's a kind of carnivalesque, uh, broad humor, bitter satire. When we were German, um, I was just checking out this morning, um, uh, Kharkiv changed hands three times in World War II between Germany and, 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 um, and Ukraine, and you can, and, and Soviet Union, rather. You can imagine the, the, the fighting that was going on at that time. And it's about hypocrisy, a fake paradise, the fake paradise of the, of the uh, Soviet Union, of when we were German. It's like when we were Soviet, almost, even when they were Soviet. And then his view of the, of the perestroika period, the immediate post-perestroika period, at dusk. This is an installation shot of how he'd made them in this time. These were made with the horizont, the, the panoramic view camera, shot low, either from the stomach or a bit lower. And they were, he made over...
of these. We didn't show 200. I think we showed about 50 of them. And here from the same series, you get this feeling at this, the ending, the sadness, the melancholy of all this. Ending society not yet knowing what it is, still not really knowing what it will be. These are from the tape. So you can see the quality of print is very different, and there's also the size is very different. They framed up. Miroslav Kulczyski and Vadim Czekorski, uh, a Dessa based artist. This is a, a film that they made uh, called Empire of Passion, based on Nagasi uh, Oshima's film Empire of the Senses, the Japanese film director. And there are the sardonic take of that. Arsen Savadov, who we've seen already. Uh, and this was pretty scandalous. He did fashion shoot in the graveyard when, when in fact, people were being buried there. And when some of the relatives turned up, you can imagine there was a hell of a trouble. And then they would produce the, in the magazine with, the, with the, what the models were or were not wearing with the different prices and who the couturiers were. I mean, there's a comment on the new oligarchs, the new money-based economy in Ukraine, which is incredibly perceptive and absolutely, I mean, coruscatingly critical. And then at the same time, look at the old Soviet past, the heroes, the Donbass workers, the miners, the Starkarnovites were, came from the Donbass, these model workers who succeed, superseded their norms. And there they are, dressed in tutus, looking rather gay, really. Vasily Sugolov, uh, uh, the fifth of the artists, a uh, very interesting painter and uh, video maker. It's a, a kind of parody of, um, of a video narrative. Then cut to 2012, Mistetsi Arsenal. And this is the, the, the Biennale that uh, Katerina mentioned, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times. And then there's another title, not one that I particularly wanted, which is Rebirth and Apocalypse in Contemporary Art. <laughs> They're very keen in Kiev to have Rebirth and Apocalypse. They really wanted Heaven and Hell. But I'd used that in the previous exhibition, so it had to be Rebirth and Apocalypse. So there's uh, 100 artists and collectives, 21 of them were from Ukraine, so it was a completely international show. And it was looking at Kiev's place on the Silk Road going east to west, and uh, the road of trade from the north to the south, where the Vikings came down uh, on their way to Constantinople, uh, and stopped to, to found Kievian Rus. And all of that was in the, in the remit of the show. Sergei Bratkov, uh, one of the, one of the uh, boys from, uh, from Kharkiv, long live the bad things of day, tomorrow we could. These are Gopniki. Gopniki, are, we call them soccer hooligans, but they're worse. They're thugs. They're kind of sometimes paid, complete gangsters. They'll kill you as soon as they look at you. And then Alexander Chaklinov, we'll, we'll be hearing more about him later, and a very good artist. The Winners series, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, quotation from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, his story about the French Revolution. It's going back to revolution, talking about revolution, and the theory of it from the French time to the present, ideas about revolution. So these rather sad, melancholic images. The Winners. Alexander Kadnikov, reflecting on the Soviet time. As there were a lot of Chinese artists in the show, I was very glad to get Mao in there somehow. And, um, whoops, sorry. This is a Soviet famous toy, kid's toy, frozen in a block, as you can see. There's Stalin's collected works of Joseph Stalin between the sandwich and the bread. And, and then Udarniki, the famous shock workers. And then that's the frozen tin of Sproti, these fish, which you could get if you were lucky in the Soviet time. Boris Mikhailov, uh, rather untypical work from him, uh, done with Isolizatia, where Katrina was working in Donetsk, and the decaying, uh, decaying uh, factories of that time. So it was rather elegaic work from him. Rep, experimental, revo <laughs> revolutionary experimental space group. This is a kind of all-stars of uh, the young artists working at that time uh, in, uh, in Kiev. 
And what they'd done, they'd taken famous art manifestos from the art history time, translated them into Ukrainian, and got bards, these folk singers in their costumes, and with their whatever it was, hurdy-gurdy is the English word, I don't know what the Ukrainian word is, to sing these mediators. Good education program. Natasha Schulte from Odessa, looking at children's homes, the submission to fate, very, very striking works. Just showing you the photography from this. And then Volva Vorotnyov, uh, a Cossack artist. Don't forget the Cossacks or the Tartars, please. And uh, these are kind of his parody of, uh, of <laughs> Cossack kitsch and landscapes. And uh, of course, it's where the Red Army, famous Red Cavalry, came from. Uh, Budioni were all Cossacks. And even. Uh, um, um, Babel, uh, Isaac Babel wrote the Red, Red Cavalry. Uh, the, the experience of a Jew in amongst Cossacks. Not very good, I can tell you. And then lastly, Balagan. Contemporary art from the former Soviet Union and other mythical places. And that's in Berlin, stretched across Berlin in 2015. And it was a kind of revisiting of the after the wall idea. Uh, from the former Soviet Union, other mythical places. I mean, it's saying an awful lot in that title. And the title, Balagan, the, the, is, um, in Russian, it's a word which has many, many meanings. It has positive meanings and negative meanings. If you go out and find nights drinking and you follow the morning, what was it like? Balagan, fantastic. I got really drunk and met lots of girls and boys or whatever, and uh, fantastic. Or, What's it like at work? Blah, blah, gun. Nothing works. No one's turning up. Everything's bad. So it, it, it can be going both that way. It's you know, best of times, worst of times. And, uh, but it also has this commedia dell'arte side to it. And I think this is very important in the history of the Russian Soviet avant-garde, is this uh, carnivalism, which runs through right from, uh, in fact, the pre-revolutionary time until the present. Sergei Bratkov, these are what he made in living in Moscow. Moscow, big top, a uh, big top, yes, like a whole circus. He's talking about Putin. Putin in this, it was described as the ringmaster of the circus. Dear Boris, we installed this work facing the Reichstag. It's perfect, the window looking out. And then dear old Arsene, Commedia dell'arte in the Crimea, made to order. It wasn't. But he obviously, I mean, he has this carnivalist side to him, as does Boris Mikhailov, as do many, many uh, artists coming out of that. And Mikola Ridni, another one of the Kharkiv school, you could say, uh, much younger than any of the others, born in 1985. Uh, he's worked directly with Mikhailov, but this is his obsession with monuments, which he's working through at that time. And national identity in different ways as they're changing. So that's, that's that. Um, just to say quickly, uh, what I got very much involved with in, in these exhibitions, these large thematic international exhibitions was really seeing how things are falling apart and how, how, to, how to express that in an exhibition in a way that bolts it into history, into the local history, but into, into a so much wider history of ideas and actions, uh, which, which artists themselves were obviously busy with, subconsciously or consciously. So that was the, that was the brief and that was what I was trying to do and uh, I hope I succeeded. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will briefly present uh, my experience in uh, organizing uh, exhibitions of Ukrainian photography in Lithuania. Uh, for almost a decade, uh, I organized 
a lot of exhibitions, events of Ukrainian photography. And uh, for example, last uh, three years uh, in Lithuania, I organized uh, more than 20 exhibitions uh, in Lithuania. And uh, I think I, I know a bit uh, about Ukrainian uh, photography. Uh, my acquaintance uh, with the Ukrainian uh, photography started in uh, 2015. Uh, when I met uh, a photographer from Ukraine, from uh, Kharkiv, uh, Roman Petkovka, uh, who was presented by uh, Katerina in previous presentation. And uh, uh, Roman Petkovka, he's a representative of a second wave of generation uh, of uh, Kharkiv School of Photography. And he is a really iconic and uh, charismatic uh, figure and really important figure in Ukrainian photography, I think, especially in the uh, Kharkiv region. Uh, we were talking a lot uh, about uh, situation, uh, photography situation in Ukraine. Uh, we were talking about uh, mm, connections with Lithuania, which were in, 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 in Soviet uh, times, in Soviet era. Uh, there were a lot of uh, stories about uh, Boris Mikhailov, Vitas Lutsku, Santana Sutkus, uh, other great photographers from Ukra Ukraine coming to Lithuania or showing their exhibitions in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, then I realized that uh, Roman has uh, his students, uh, young people, uh, he he was teaching them uh, photography, and uh, that was uh, really interesting for me because at that time I really know uh, very little about the uh, situation of uh, contemporary photography in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I had, uh, like, uh, since uh, 2018, uh, like every year, a few visits uh, to Ukraine. And uh, that was really good because uh, you can get uh, to know people. I, I met uh, lo uh, lots of uh, young photographers, uh, older generation photographers. And in 2019, I came to the idea to organize and to, ma to make an exhibition of uh, contemporary photography uh, of Ukraine in Lithuania. Uh, this was a, a challenge. Uh, I already knew uh, quite a lot of uh, photographers, and uh, I started to think, what should I do? Uh, but uh, the main uh, aspect uh, for my future exhibition was the uh, situation that, like, when you're getting know, uh, to know uh, photographers, uh, young photographers or older generation photographers, it, it was really interesting because, like, uh, in almost every case, uh, you... you you can realize, uh, I saw that there, are, uh, there were a lot of nudity in uh, their photographs, in their pictures. And uh, it was really striking, and uh, I, was, I, I, I started to think, uh, what is this? Uh, then I realized it was some kind of a continuity of a tradition of Ukrainian photography, because uh, uh, Kharkiv School, uh, photographers from uh, uh, group uh, Vreme, uh, they were using uh, nudity a lot in the in the projects in the series, and uh, maybe this was the case. I thought, and uh, I started to researching it, and uh, then it was uh, like a main idea. It became like one of the main ideas uh, how to connect, uh, how to compose uh, this exhibition. Um, but since uh, I was quite new in Ukrainian context of photography. Uh, I invited the Ukrainian uh, researcher, uh, art critic, uh, Halina Hleba, to help me with this exhibition. So she became like a co uh, so curator of uh, this project. And uh, we collected uh, 13 uh, photographers, uh, artists, uh, who are working with the photography as a main uh, media. Uh, and in... Uh, at the, uh, at the end of uh, 2019, in Klaipeda, we organized uh, this exhibition, uh, which uh, is called Love, Lust and Fury, with the main themes uh, of uh, nudity. Some of the uh, works uh, were dealing with the quite uh, uh, dangerous uh, limits, uh, let's say, showing uh, 
children, nudity or sexuality, like uh, pictures from uh, artist group uh, Gorsat. Uh, some of, most of them were really provocative, and uh, I remember uh, guys, uh, photographers, they were saying that, you know, what you are doing here in Klaipeda is really um, brave and interesting because even in Ukraine, in Kiev or in Kharkiv, we can't imagine if we could show such works uh, in public because we have um, a bit different situation, like Red Wing uh, movement is uh, very active and uh, they told me stories how some exhibitions are destroyed, ruined uh, during the shows. And, uh, And what was uh, really nice that uh, I managed to invite uh, for the opening uh, of the exhibition most of the artists who were participating in this project. And uh, I think seven or eight uh, photographers came with their friends, uh, other photographers, and Roman Petkovka, he was participating in, uh, in that event uh, too. So it was really nice. Yeah, so this is him. Uh, looking at uh, Bogdan Gulai theory. Uh, uh, exhibition was held in uh, Klaipeda, the city where I'm from. This is the biggest uh, exhibition space, Klaipeda Culture Communication Center Exhibition Hall. And we took a uh, whole uh, second floor of that institution and uh, 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 it was 2019, but uh, of course I knew the situation, uh, what was happening in Ukraine, and uh, part of the exhibition was... Uh, and the idea was to show works uh, of photographers uh, who were dealing with the war situation in Ukraine since it started in 2014, and back then uh, part of Ukraine was occupied already. Crimea was occupied, uh, war was going in the eastern parts uh, of Ukraine. So some uh, some projects were talking about the situation, like in this case, Sergei Melnichenko series, Military Commissariat, or uh, Andrei Lamakin series, Amulet, where he's uh, showing uh, citizens uh, of Ukraine uh, buying legally or illegally guns, uh, getting armed, uh, preparing for maybe a large invasion from a uh, close neighbor, and uh, as far as we know now, it uh, that's uh, what happened. So in that case, uh, some of these series are really uh, like, uh, how to say, prophetic uh, at that time. And uh, this is Igor Chakachkov, who is uh, with us uh, during these days here in, my, in, in the symposium, and uh, we were showing uh, his project uh, too. Uh, Andrei Boyko, and uh, his series Second Hand Generation. Sasha Kurmas, uh, most of the photographers you already heard uh, yesterday or, or today in uh, different presentations. Uh, most of them you can see in uh, exhibition here, which is presented here by, by Open Eye Gallery. Uh, back then, at that time, uh, I think it was, um, as far as I know, first attempt uh, to organize and to show like a big group uh, show exhibition of uh, contemporary Ukrainian photography abroad. Uh, so this was uh, really nice, and uh, we had uh, like really good and uh, uh, reviews uh, from uh, for, from participants or from other colleagues uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is photographer Stanislav Ostrovus and uh, Andrei Boyko. Yeah, I mentioned about this series uh, of uh, Andrei Lamakin. Gorsat, and uh, we we published uh, mm, like small edition, like compilation of uh, postcards from the exhibition, and you can find it uh, here among uh, other books. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Halina Hleba was the sole curator of the exhibition, and uh, she wrote a great uh, text uh, about uh, the exhibition about the idea, what we were trying uh, to do, what we were showing. And uh, now I would like to read the small part uh, from it. Uh, 
Young Ukrainian artists look at themselves and reality where the search for balance between personal and civil freedom turns into a struggle with oneself. Existence in con condition of virtual post-truth and real war is embodied as constant defense of the right to one's identity. Even the body, the, the last in inalienable fortress of individuality, belongs less and less to a particular person. The Ukrainian body hides the fears and doubts of many generations. Collective traumas turn into stigmas of public body, of public body, and the rejection of nudity becomes a future of the national idea, a feature of the national idea. Since the 20th century until now, during the waves of sexual revolutions and pornographic oversaturations, humanity has not been able to attribute the body to a separate person. In the 20th first century, the body is political, still collective, and still reified. Perhaps that's why, that is why we desire to destroy such body, to destroy this social construct in order to accept it after that. Maybe we'll even fall in love for your close one and for yourself. So I think this is it. Working? Okay. So I'm the next one who will present in the, my practicing, and I will start uh, actually from 2015. In that a year, uh, I established the photo festival in Ukraine, and actually it was, and that like, and it's still the only one photo festival in Ukraine. And um, uh, important to say why it happened, because like it was a reaction on the war, which it starts in 2014. And um, uh, also like in during this period of time, it was so many images as used as a manipulation and propaganda in the media and it was just like the internet like just full of all this uh, fake news and like by using the images and for me it was really important like to start this conversation to educate people maybe how to read the images and how to find out where's the propaganda where's manipulation where's actually the true story and the second reason of course like which we discussed already the two days it's education because like as it was mentioned by the previous speakers, like in Ukraine, there's no education in photography. So uh, festival for us, it was kind of the platform to provide the different um, uh, workshops, lectures, uh, some kind of knowledge by the sharing experience and also like to bring community together. So from 2015, we had like uh, different events, like it was each uh, year in spring in Odessa, and each time it was gathering of the bench of uh, photographers from the completely different parts, like from the art photography, conceptual photography, from the documentary reportage, like for all like this, because it was like one of the places where photographers uh, was possible to gather and actually to share the experience and to get some knowledge. And um, uh, like in 2022, of course, like we didn't manage to do our ninth edition of the festival and um, we switch uh, completely our activities and uh, unfortunately by now we are not able like to host the festival it's uh, not safe uh, in ukraine and uh, specifically in odessa so uh, we uh, change our activities and we change the way how our team is working right now so from uh, february we became let's say uh, one person um, agency because like uh, uh, a lot of Ukrainian photographers, by no having any experience, but they became the war photographers. We will talk about this a little bit more on the last session today. And um, uh, as they started to document it, uh, the situation, the war in their own uh, cities, 
but they didn't know where to spread this knowledge and where to show these images and actually how to work with the image. So we started like to became as a, a mediators to collect the photography from the different photographers whom we know uh, and to spread them for the different uh, media. And uh, it was like our completely volunteering job, but like also what we tried like to do is like from one side to share the news what's going on in Ukraine, because like we uh, worked with the 30 photographers in that time uh, who were actually based in the completely different regions. But also from another side, it's also like to support them that like by the also financial question, by the fees, but also like just to support to make their voices visible and also like to help them maybe to find the assignments for the international agencies. Uh, we did it like about like half a year and um, uh, then uh, it's also like uh, when we came to the moment that like uh, all our photographers more or less founded the assignments and the international collaborations we all actually switched to another activities because we started like to uh, make uh, like exhibitions outside of ukraine but also like what is important like was for us like that we collaborated with the different institutions we did like the exhibitions of ukrainian photography in the different countries but it was important not just showing the war photography because it was plenty of uh, them in the media in that time but it was important like to maybe like to open up certain topics like for example what is Ukrainian photography nowadays how did it develop like uh, why it's developed like this or like uh, how the fight for the independence going on through the photography or how the manipulation going through the photography so we started like to do different or different exhibitions uh, and like in each exhibition it was different topics different like collection of the artist uh, but like also like it was the way to actually like to bring these questions and to show how photography is actually connected to the political situation but also how uh, the fight is going on through the photography and in this and also like the case to show that this is war not only in Ukraine but also like to show the connections in the global uh, way um, and this is, for example, our last show, uh, which is like right now is uh, going on in Brussels in the Hunger Gallery, and it will be open like till um, end of uh, March. But another, like what is was important for us, like uh, it's like uh, not just to showing and promote Ukrainian photography, but also to support Ukrainian photographers. And what we found out in 2022 that like um, the uh, youngsters, like the people on the age of uh, 60 and uh, 20, it's like actually they really um, um, like the age when the for them who are still living in Ukraine, it's really complicated because like you are not really able like to talk about your traumatizing experience with your parents because you know that like the parents are in the same situation. Also, you're not really able like to talk with your uh, friends because like still this is the age when you're like trying to be brave enough and to show that you are not have any fear. But this is the age when you have to reflect and to somehow to go through this traumatic experience while you're living in Ukraine. So we uh, created the mentorship program for the teenagers and it was online mentorship program and we received uh, 88 applications. Uh, we managed to select it 44 young uh, photographers from the completely different regions. Some of them in that time were in the occupied territory. Some of them were already like in the other countries. Some of them were like in the west part or south of part of Ukraine. But it was, it was really important because like by uh, the, this online program and working in the groups, but only with the mentors, it's really helped them to reflect their traumatic experience, but also to show from their perspective what is war in Ukraine. So also like the results we show like in the different uh, um, cities and different uh, places, like for example, the there was open uh, space, uh, open like air exhibition in Paris. And um, uh, another uh, program which we also established and another step, it was like also like the way to work with the vernacular photography, but especially the vernacular photography, which is like now main um, talking on the front line by the soldiers. So another our project, it was uh, reframing my body, the war edition, and we 
uh, started to work with the female soldiers from the front, who is like now like based on the front line and who's working on the front line. And we collected their stories and their images from their phone to show their stories from the front line. This is another case because like it's not also possible for the professional photographers to come for the front line. You have you need to have the special permission and it's quite complicated. And in this case it was like the alternative way to talk about what's going on there like through actually the stories of the female soldiers. And what is important like the both of these uh, results of these two projects are available on our webpage in English English and Ukrainian, so if you're interested, you can really discover this, um, uh, these two projects in details. And um, uh, the last, uh, not last, but like the one of our, another initiative which I uh, want to share, it's uh, the initiative which called the Information Front. Uh, this uh, we created like together in the collaboration with uh, photographer Christopher Noon and Donald Weber. And uh, uh, the first edition actually happened like in March 2022. And what we decided, like it was really fast reaction on the situation. So like by this, the first volume, we wanted to show the Ukrainian war photography. And first of all, like to spread it uh, outside of Ukraine and like to show to the agencies with whom they can collaborate it, like with whom they can work and whom to invite it for, as uh, Ukrainian photographers. But secondly, it's also like to, uh, uh, by the distribution of and sellings of this newspaper and this like uh, information front volumes, like we are collecting money for the support Ukrainian photographers in needs, but not for the projects, but like mostly for them who actually like uh, lost their houses or like uh, lost something or lost their health or lost relatives so like really needs like some small support in this in this time so the first one uh, volume was focused on the war the second volume it was focused on the history of ukrainian photography but brief history of ukrainian photography and the third one is actually uh, was recently published and it's focused on the stories from the 2013 to the 2023 10 years of this turbulence time and this is like really a long like long 10 years of fight and uh, so each uh, volume has uh, different uh, focuses but also like uh, by the uh, it's like giving like possibility to discover Ukrainian photography as a professionals but also like vernacular photography and the young generation photography but also it gives the possibility to collect the support for Ukrainian photographers all of these three volumes are here on the table so like if you'll be interesting you can see them after and um, and yes and this is like our activities right now so you can see how the transformation happened for us as a festival from the moment of the bring the education we now working for the uh, support programs only. Thank you. Um, I will make a very brief presentation of one particular project uh, which we and Victoria Bovikina were working on since 2022. Um, it's the platform called Ukrainian Photographies, which originated from the NGO not for profit organization we called Ukrainian Photography, which we founded in 2020 in Kiev, having the idea that we want to work on development and maybe increasing the visibility of Ukrainian photography abroad. And in 2022, when the full-scale invasion of Russia started, we were living in London and we were asking questions, what could we do probably to support the common cause and common effort to, to, to make sure that Ukrainian culture and photography in, in particular remains visible, remains, ali remains alive, remains active. And um, at that time, there were many grassroots, but also um, institutional initiatives aimed at uh, protecting, preserving the cultural heritage, evacuating the collections abroad, which was, of course, was the, the most important thing at the time. But at the same time, we thought that 
probably the one of the ways to make Ukrainian photography um, be more visible abroad in, and at the same time to give people abroad more understanding of Ukraine at the time when Russia propaganda, Russian propaganda was uh, extremely uh, active for already many years. So we thought we need to try and engage international researchers, curators, art historians, organizations to research and work with Ukrainian photography. And what would be the result is probably the new research materials in English, which is crucial. So they will be available long term and for other English speaking researchers. So the idea of the platform is quite simple. We, we invite uh, international photography researchers, so art researchers, to work with Ukrainian photography and write a short articles, reviews, or curators can uh, curate an online exhibition, which is a specific part of the, of the, of the platform. For example, you can see the review by uh, Michael Kurtz, who is presenting a little bit later on the work of Yaroslav Solop. And I think this is a great example of a new external researcher looking at the work in a different way and produces the new kind of perspective. And it was really refreshing for us at least, but we, we, know, we knew this work for a long time, but Michael provided some different opinion, which how we think the art and culture is actually working. So it's the constant dialogue and the constant conversation which makes it all be relevant so we try to contextualize ukrainian photography maybe within the broader cultural discourse not uh, not showing it as a as some separate uh, vacuum space but trying to to make it a part of the of the global context uh, there are obviously challenges because the organizations the organization is now only two of us, and uh, the plan is now that we probably will restructure the website a little bit after we finish with the Venice Biennale. We will try to make this platform maybe less oriented on um, exhibitions, but more oriented on becoming an archive, like a storage of knowledge. So be accessible, put in a very simple form, so where you can probably go and search by author and uh, find some different uh, types of research on this author. And I would just wanted to say that we are super um, happy and welcoming if anyone would be interested in working with us and uh, writing about something, making a rev review or, or an article. So this is basically the main message I would like to, I would like to say. Hi, uh, my name is Emine Zedinova, and I um, will be talking today about Ukrainian Warchive, which is a digital, um, it's a digital photo archive of Russo-Ukrainian war. Uh, so um, the initiative started uh, in 2022, um, half a year probably after invasion took place. And um, it started with uh, myself, Misha Pidan, Zhenia Safonov and Katya Sergatskova. And the idea, uh, the, uh, it was a response pretty much to the invasion. Uh, idea was what, uh, what Ukrainian photographers going through and what's happening right now in Ukraine. And of course, like we are very integrated in the community and we knew that there is a problem with Ukrainian photojournalists trying to like moving, some of them moving to the west of Ukraine, some evacuating, some are staying, returning back. And there is always a question what happens to all these hard drives and what happens to all of this work, which is digital, most of it produced digitally. And is there is a place for these photographers to store photography and actually to preserve? And of course, one of the issues, like as me, as a person who uh, come a little bit more from history and sociology background, um, as, uh, me, uh, as actually Max mentioned as well, is uh, how much um, ra um, Russian narrative you was using history and twisting history throughout like towards Ukraine and how much it was used 
to attack Ukraine to justify this invasion and like war crimes and stuff. So for us, it was very important also to create some kind of a platform or like thing which is in long term perspective would be some kind of a platform which uh, can lead back researchers who are interested in this period of time. And, um, and we believe this is actually uh, a changing time for a European and global history and to go back and research and see and find these photos and um, by Ukrainian photographers. And uh, we haven't started to work with foreign photographers yet, but um, and uh, to have a photograph, a description of the photograph, and to be able to search through the big database. Um, so that was um, initial idea. And also, it also responds to probably a general problem, which a lot of photographers worldwide face what to do with uh, their work. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a lifelong work. And as a time changing, uh, we are talking about digital work, which is uh, pretty much uh, in storages and hard drives. And for Ukrainian photographers, um, it's, it's unfortunately the reality is that um, even if you store your work in several storages or clouds, if only you have an access to it and logging, like personal logins to it, it's also a question, if something happens to you, what's going to happen, who is going to have an access, who, where are these photographs, how researchers and like, or how we can preserve the work which pretty much Ukrainian photographers are risking their lives for. And so, um, as um, it is, like um, I'm going to talk about challenges a little bit more. So one of the things which we thought about is how we will present like these photos or how to make it available for researchers and how to make available it visible. So we came up with this um, idea of this platform, uh, which is uh, I'm sharing the design of demo version, which we haven't launched it yet, but we hope to launch it by um, well, it's supposed to be 1st of March, but now it's 1st of April. Uh, it's one of the challenges we are facing. Uh, but we, um, we reach out to uh, developers of, um, if you know the project Photogrammer, it's, uh, it's um, a visualization of uh, a US Congress archive of depression and uh, the beginnings of First World War. So um, we got in touch with uh, these two professors who developed it. It's a distant viewing lab at Richmond University. So we are working with them. They already developed the main engine, which allows us to navigate through the map and timeline and to present photos. But um, we are now like trying to put this new design on top of this engine, and that's what's happening. Um, and uh, pretty much what will happen I hope that will happen, that you would be able to click on the region of the, you can uh, put like to click on the region or on the city and see, uh, see the selection of the images from that region. And then you can also work on timeline and select certain months or something. And then you can see what we have in the archive and what photographers were working on it. And um, to make it able, oops. Uh, to make it able to do that, um, and what archive is supposed to do, is pretty much to have to a lot of descriptive information, as we uh, find out ourselves. As a people who work in media and uh, who are photographers, all four of us who, when we started, we are photographers and media people, we saw that, like, okay, we are making a platform, we'll make it in one month or two months, but then it's, and I did study history, but it's, I started like looking into archiving and I started reading about it and how, and there is a lot more, like you need to develop backbone of archive, which is pretty much the structure of archive, how you store your collections, in which, which like phones go into which collections and how you name files for the files to be found in these collections later on. And all this filing needs to be by, the, by international standards and to refer to country, refer to the photographers, refer to the folder. And so we developed this database, which um, I'm just sharing because like I know that like people may be interested. So like with um, each photograph pretty much needs to be entered in this 
data sheets which with the description of each item and then we have also tags creator series genres exif files data diction and tag description which is like another six tabs uh, which needs to be filled up and that is one of the main challenges when you're talking about archiving and working with war photographers who are actively shooting and working in the field is that one thing is to get photographs for them. The moment you want all of this data, which you pretty much need to make that platform work, it takes time from them, it takes time from us, it takes a lot of, it requires resources, which we um, have quite limited resources. And also the question of motivation, of uh, like motivating photographers to do that. Because it's clearly one thing is asking one photograph with one description, and then you're asking them like, I don't know, 1,000 photographs with description. It means that they need to sit and do that. And then you come back to the question of resources when we don't have resources to pay them to sit and work on that. And that is kind of like a vicious cycle in which we're working in, and then you're asking for a favor, and you, you, it's, it's all kind of connected and start to be connected, and also personalities, and how well you know photographers, or you don't know. And then I can talk more about challenges, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it just, um, um, it's, uh, it's a big issue. And I would say one of the issues which we are trying to solve right now except for collecting and putting it in databases and creating the platform. One of the main issues, we archives cannot exist as initiatives. And at the moment, we are initiative. It's a grassroots. And uh, people who are co-founders, we all work as a pro bono basis. And, um, and so the question is, like, how do we become like not initiative but some kind of organization or institution which can exist and which could survive time because we are talking about historical archive and so and I put a lot of thinking around it and a lot of going around and um, so far um, we are trying to find a long-term partner um, and which uh, academic institution pretty much, which we can work a long term with, with having Ukrainian archive as a separate project, a separate NGO which is registered in Ukraine, but at the same time having a mirror archive with academic institution and having, um, having them to store it and maintain. Because with digital archives, we are talking about digital files with in technology changing world, pretty much which requires quite a lot of maintenance work. Uh, and it means that every three years, like or every two years, someone needs to go back to all the files, need to check that the files are still like the same format as everyone uses, and they can be opened and things like that. And uh, clearly there is also a, a top of it, if we're talking about um, about negatives and scans, we're talk talking about T format saving as archival uh, format, but if you're talking about digital files, there is no conventional thing like what you need to be saving them in, and clearly we are receiving files in GPACs. Um, so, and um, I'm just going to uh, tell um, on the curating, I guess, it, uh, um, one of the kind of, it's it probably kind of one of the other goals of archive is to promote Ukrainian perspective. And so we, um, we have done um, several exhibitions in Sweden actually, partly because we have a Swedish partner um, and uh, we got some funding from Swedish Institute. Uh, and, um, and so another thing is like what we published is a book which is called Sorting Stories of War. It's over there on the table. You can also go through it. And um, uh, there are two editors and like uh, concept designers, I guess. It's myself and Misha Pidan, who was mentioned several times today, uh, to yesterday and today, who is from Kharkov himself and lives in Sweden. And, um, and we thought um, quite a lot about war photography and how to present it in, in in the um, in the book, and um, and um, what we came up with. So, 
Actually, 10 projects out of these 13 were supported by small grants, uh, which we distributed to support long-term projects on covering the war. And, um, and we thought how to make it, I don't know, what to put there and how to put there, and what perspective. Is that just, is that just the book supposed to be just about the war, or is that the book about photographers, or is that the book about people and the stories? So, um, we wanted really what we wanted is to bring this personal experience of the photographer and put it so what a personal stories and to make it like for the reader to understand the personal experience of the photographer who have been doing that project as well so um, we decided to include text uh, with photo essays which consist eight to 13 uh, eight to 12 photos each, uh, maybe one of them is more, uh, but uh, to include text written by photographers themselves. And um, it's very different formats, and we decided to go with different format because it gives a feeling of um, immediateness and like connection and rawness. Because this war is very new, I mean, the invasion at least, because the photos like only from invasion time, 2022. And um, I think I'll um, I'll skip through some photographs. Uh, this is uh, Julia. Oops. Oops, sorry. Um, and we also tried to include like quite diverse group of photographers working in different type of uh, documentary photography, uh, from classic photojournalism to more of using documentary as a medium for more artistic projects about the war. Uh, so um, Yulia Kochtova is a photographer from Kiev, uh, and she has been working covering the Russo-Ukrainian war since 2014. But, um, and she has, uh, she's spending a lot of time on the front line. And actually, um, I want to share the, text and uh, which she submitted with uh, her project, which called What is Personal. Um, I still have time, right? No? Okay. I'm not going to share. You can read it. It's very, it's very interesting poem. Um, and just skipping through, Jana Kononova, who is working with a uh, medium format camera, uh, radiations of war project, uh, looking at how war is kind of radiating every aspect of society and and uh, every place in Ukraine, um, which is one of them is a kind of more of collage, it's painted photograph of the um, exhumated body. Um, Evgeny Mar uh, Malaletka, who I mentioned before, who won World Press Photo with his uh, images from Siege of Mariupol. Um, Lisa Bukreva, do not look at the pain of others, which is very interesting project and comment on consuming information. Uh, what she's done is she photographed the footages coming from social media and all different kind of a channels in the first months of invasion, which she was pretty much consuming as a Ukrainian and photographing a lot of like casualties, civilians, like bodies and stuff. So it's kind of, and uh, her photograph is on the cover of the book actually. Um, Roma Pachkovsky uh, with torture rooms, which is interesting case when the person used to be photographing mostly in the studio and done studio portraitures and uh, musicians and like all different kind of celebrities. And these days pretty much photographing and documenting war. And this is a project from the CISO in Kherson, Alona Grom, um, who have done a project on the mental hospital, which was under uh, occupation in Borodyanka. Uh, Serhii Maliletka, naive Ukrainian gardens, he photographed... Hmm? Oh, God, Serhii Polizhak, I'm really sorry. Uh, naive Ukrainian gardens, he photographed the, on panoramic camera the gardens which were affected with visible, with visible war effects and um, it's not correct and Sasha Kurmas I'm not going to talk because we already talked about him but there are more of photography there and different type of projects also all the sales from the book will go into grants so if you feel like buying please buy the book it will go directly to Ukrainian photographers and their projects thank you uh, uh.
that was an extraordinary journey and I would like to thank um, all the panelists for, for their courageous and tireless and uh, oftentimes altruistic <laughs> work that they are doing to, um, to support Ukrainian photography, to popularize it, to uh, make people fall in love with it and um, to educate. So there are such a fantastic uh, initiatives. I would suggest, because we are kind of running out of time, uh, that we steal uh, another five, ten minutes from the lunch break and, and we uh, take uh, directly the questions from the audience, if there are any, uh, because I think the old, old presentations were extremely interesting and there should be questions. Um, yeah, there's an amazing amount of agency here. Um, individuals that are kind of instigating, I suppose, um, that agency and bringing others on board. And I'm, I'm just interested in, um, in your experience, just that thinking of collaboration and how um, important collaboration is now for the, your endeavours, because it feels to me like... Um, um, it's you know you, you're all in different ways um, bringing people both from Ukraine and outside of Ukraine to to um, take something for you know to take something forward that's going to be of use and also powerful in, in the future with it, with an eye to the future I suppose um, and so I just wondered whether you might reflect a little bit on on collaboration and what collaboration you feel you you need going forward um i mean you, you you touched on it a little bit but perhaps expanding on that idea of collaboration and what could support you going forward uh, maybe i'll just start like uh, from the uh, perspective of ukrainian photographers i could say that uh, nowadays especially, uh, a lot of them, it's important to feel that they are not uh, live by themselves. And this is like the one of important way of collaboration that like it's really to know that they are risking their, take a risk of their life and to making the images and that it will be visible, these images, and that these images can do something and that these images will be accepted outside of Ukraine. Because like it's like, I think this is like one of the importance that uh, while you're living in Ukraine, especially if you're a male photographer who are not able to travel even outside of Ukraine and you're staying in this condition so long time and it's really, uh, you're kind of became in this bubble and uh, in this bubble, this is a lot of personal emotions, personal reflections, and still this uh, work uh, which has to be done on the front line, taking the risk. And this is the most important, this way of to have this touch and be connected with outside world by the different projects involved, by the different publications, by the different feedbacks, by the different feedbacks in the social media, but to be, to have this touch and to feel that you are not alone on this on this work and that you are still uh, doing important job and you are taking this risk for something and you have reason for this. So I think in this moment, this is like one of the most important to have this connection in this case. I'll be, I'll be complaining around this. Um, so um, if you're talking about like a collaboration between like, um, between like, for example, Ukrainian initiatives, which are, there are quite a lot, I think the you run into um, issue. I I feel like I, I mean from my experience we run into issue that a lot of these initiatives they run as like let's say NGOs or or um, and a lot of these initiatives are around some person who has some trust from photographers. Let's say Katya Rachinka, she knows these people or someone like photographers know her, they trust her. And or like Olya Kovalyova, Mstislav uh, Chernov, uh, who are like run uh, association of photographers, Ukrainian. Or like, I don't know, in our case as well, they say it's Zhenya Safonov or, or my, like maybe not me. Um, and um, 
<laughs> but what I'm trying to say is like, and also there is no institutionalized ways and protocols and agreements signed with photographers. So let's say I like let's say we we are trying to think about how to develop collections without like trying to to get like for example to have a collection of other organizations within our archive. The issue is there is no a direct like there is all these organizations build on trust, there were no money paid to photographers, so the photos were used like on the trust kind of thing. And so you cannot really even make any kind of legal agreement of like transferring or like putting it in the archive or something like that. And another thing is there is like the community is very small and there is always someone doesn't like someone. And that is prevent a lot of things. And there is always this like, phrase, oh, this person is there, I'm not going to participate, or like, I'm not going to collaborate on this. Even though this, like, a lot of these initiatives are very similar or bigger as an idea, or like, or actually not even, it's, it's, I would say, different, and they should be collaborating. But I think, like, this institutionalization thing is a really, really big thing, which is, which is, I think, moving forwards needs to be solved in some way within like Ukraine. I'm being, in a, I'm being in an interesting position answering the question from Sarah about collaboration <laughs> as a as a partner or organizing partner of the symposium, but I think it was um, absolutely crucial in the collaborations because all the initiatives, many initiatives they were developed because of the necessity and they were really maybe rushed and uh, there was the motivation, there was a certain goal set, but it's m usually individuals who come up with a great idea and maybe they have trust of the community because for Ukrainian photographers, we asked photographers to, to participate. We asked the researchers to participate and it was built exclusively of us persuading people that it's for the good cause and you it will be something meaningful. But uh, over time, I think it's very important to, as Eminem said, maybe institu institutionalization, oh, sorry. So to, to create maybe, to, to, to create a structure which can be sustainable, which can be lasting, and you cannot make it without uh, partnerships sometimes, because even to navigate this, um, space of possibilities you need a partner who knows better the specific region who maybe can find funding which is crucial of course so uh yeah it's just absolutely indispensable the collaboration now just to say in the time leading up to after the wall so uh in say 97 98 99 um, there were the soros centers operating all across eastern europe Marta Kuzma was running the one in uh, Ukraine. And she certainly was a very, very important link for us and the conduit through which we made contact with other people. Um, working later, I mean, for the Kiev Biennale in 2015, 12, uh, it, um, that was more delicate. I was really taking advice from the young curators there. And some of the galleries, I must say that Pavel Gudimov was very, very helpful at Gallery Ya. And he, he he had a really good eye, and not just for one kind of art, but lots of kind of art, and particularly with, with the Ukrainian artists, he was a very big help. So our next uh, panel uh, is about Alexander Chekminov. Uh, whose name we mentioned a number of times already. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, moderator of this panel, Ben, ben uh, Harman, who is the director of Stills, a center for photography in Edinburgh, Scotland. And since joining Stills in 2014, he has overseen the launch of the Stills School uh, Educational Program and the uh, development of Steel's analog and digital photography production facilities. And uh, he also contributed uh, to the book, uh, to the publication uh, Home, uh, 
and we have a pleasure to read some of his texts here, accompanying the, some of the photographs, uh, in particular uh, the photographs of uh, uh, the works of Daria Svirtlova and Alexander Chekminov. Um, shall I introduce the other two panelists as well? Okay. Um, then we have uh, with us Victoria Bavikina, who is a curator, art critic, and um, soci uh, sociologist of cu culture. Uh, she is a co founder of Ukrainian Photographies um, and co curator of the Home uh, program. Uh, she was a curator at the Grinov Art Collection um, and an art director of ACT Art Space in Kyiv. Uh, and she's currently a co-curator of the Ukrainian Pavilion in uh, the Venice Biennial. Uh, and uh, we have uh, as well with us uh, Emine uh, Zaitadinova, uh, who we had the pleasure to uh, get to know a little bit better through the, her uh, curation uh, of uh, work, I'm, work archive uh, that she presented in the, at the previous panel. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me and inviting me. Thank you to the organizers. It's a real privilege for me to be here and to make my small contribution to what's been a really interesting couple of days. I'm the director of Stills, which is a, a photography gallery. Most people know it as a photography gallery in the center of Edinburgh, a public photography gallery. It's nearly 50 years old. Uh, but we also have an education program, Stills School, which is an alternative photography school. And we also have dark rooms, uh, analog and digital production facilities. So I've listened with great interest yesterday and today about how we, how Stills, where we sit in the context of uh, the history, really, of, of photography from Ukraine, and it's been really interesting. I've learned a lot. A small disclaimer from me, which is that um, I'm by, by no means an expert. I think probably 80% of everything I've learned about photography from Q Ukraine, I've learned within the last sort of 30 hours. Um, but I'm very happy to be here with, with, with two people who know a lot more about what we're talking about today. I'm also really interested to sort of bring my perspective um, to the work of Alexander Chekmanov and uh, to think of it from the point of view as someone who's mainly working with Scottish, British photography within an international context. Um, I should say that Stills will be taking the home exhibition this summer and we'll, we'll host the exhibition from August to early October. It will run during the Edinburgh Festival period, which is a very busy time in August in Edinburgh. So I hope some of you will be able to see it there, and I hope we do the, the work justice. Final point I wanted to make, which we were talking about this morning, which is that, um, I mean, we call him Sasha. Should we just say, so yeah. Uh, Sasha is very much alive and working and active. <laughs> we're not talking about a, a photographer who's, who's passed away, we, and we thought that was really important to kind of remember that whilst we talk, we can't talk for him or what he, he might be thinking now or even making at this minute. Um, okay, I'll stop with my little introduction there. So the first thing I wanted to ask is, just for the benefit of people that aren't that familiar with Sasha's work, a little bit of biographical information, where he grew up, the kind of social political context um, for his upbringing and maybe an idea of how he got into photography and whether there was any kind of formal uh, education involved. So who would like to? <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Ben, for introduction. And uh, uh, Sasha Chekminov, or Alexander Chekminov, uh, he's originally from Lugansk. It's uh, a little bit like difficult region with difficult and complicated history with a history of long coal mining industry. And uh, Sasha, as a photographer and as a professional, for me, he is very rooted in his context. So if you understand the, like, back, his background, you really could understand his approach as a photographer. So. 
Uh, when we talk about Sasha and you ask about his education, so he didn't, uh, as I know, he didn't finish any like official artistic or photography like uh, university or courses. I think he just finished like six months, uh, really short term courses in some photo studio that I think was uh, just for him to take more knowledge, like technical knowledge, how to do photos. But when we talk about Sasha this morning, Emine said that uh, because uh, Emine and Sasha, they are friends. Uh, I mean, that, uh, and I read it in a lot of his interviews he, that he's always wanted to be a photographer. And from his childhood, he know that he will be connected with some artistic stuff and uh, a photographer in particular. Um, yeah, I um, just want to agree about um, Lugan. I just want to. Um, he was born in 1969, so when collapse of Soviet Union happened pretty much in 1991, when um, he was in his 20s and starting as photographer. So we are talking like, and he just got like, uh, came back from his military service pretty much, and he just started like working in the photo atelier, which like making like portraits probably at that point. It's like, uh, we, we still talking not like completely independent Ukraine, but post-Soviet, like very post-Soviet um, time. and. It's important to understand that what surrounded him that time, it's industrial town which like was built around coal mining. And it's all pretty much the system collapsed and the system was centralized to Moscow. And it meant that what was happening in society was like kind of like a historical moment as well when I don't know, people start do not having jobs, the coal mines starting like shutting down, there were like complete like social economical collapse happening around him, and he himself and his family were directly affected by it. So it's not that he was like just outsider looking at it, he was living it. And um, when we look at his photographs like uh, from that time, like 90s, we see a lot of kind of like what he called like people of street, street people, um, and uh, and sometimes, like looking back from this perspective from today, it feels like, oh my gosh, where did he found these people? How did he found these marginalized like people looking like so poor and so whatever, whatever, whatever? But it's important to understand that it was a life. Then it was everywhere at that point. And I myself like. I remember as a child, as a small child, 90s, when we moved back, back from the deportation place in Uzbekistan to Crimea. And as I said, I remember, like, I remember my neighbors in the village. And they were like, on the one side, they were alcoholics who, like, he, he, like my, my neighbor Valera with his daughter died of uh, cirrhosis. And then on the other side, a couple of alcoholics who were, like, having, like, ha have been having kids one after another. And that was just, like, surrounding him. So, like, I think, like, it's important to put, like, that in the context. And I think what Sasha was really interested in is a uh, history, this historical moment of collapsing. And, like, and I think, like, if you, from conversation with him before, uh, I'm, and... I understood that he's kind of obsessed with the idea of history and that he's like preserving historical moments for future or like and how, and when he describes how he got into photography that as a child he looks through some photos and like some books with visual contents like from beginning of 20th century and he thought wow these people like these people are already gone but there are still pictures or there are still like visuals from that time and so he hadn't been part of anything and Lugansk himself, itself, at that point, if you put in the context of photography in general, was very isolated from like places where photography as a profession was happening. Like we're talking about, it was not Moscow, it was not Kiev, it was not even Kharkov. And so he was like pretty much by himself there with an idea with a camera, just photographing around, surrounding what's happening. This like. And for him, these people were representing, especially people who like have challenges and like more challenges in life, like were representing like changing historical moment, I would say. So 
Yeah, I think now we could see uh, the first series of uh, Czech Minov, and. Uh, this series is about his uh, region, and Emine just said that he is uh, just uh, photographed everything that he was seeing around him. This, his neighbors, his friends, the people just around, with him around. Very much uh, lived experience recording his people uh, not patronizing, not cynical. I wonder if, if you know where he might have had this idea that photography could do this. Would, would there have been newspapers or other, other printed material that he would have seen that would have given him an early understanding of the power of photography, for want of a better term? Okay, I, I can tell what I know. <laughs> um, I think, um, I'm not sure that he exactly looked at other photographies before or like was like looking at like and saying, okay, this is how it's done and I'm going to do this way. I feel like for him and as a people, if people, if you know him personally, you know, he, a lot of things he does is like kind of intuitively and not exactly coming from training or like he kind of does it as a like internal how to say internal calling and i think like what he knew at the time that pictures and camera definitely fixate the moment and fixate people and then you have a print you have a negative and he it's i think for him it's intuitive came like as it's a, it's it's like preserving history and um, as I said before, like he was quite isolated in Lugansk from photography world. And also himself, like as, as many people at the time were very, very poor. So like he mentions quite a lot about these times. It was how hard it was to get for him or to buy, to get money, to get film or to process it, like chemicals for processing it. And so, um, and uh, he also mentions uh, in, in his, um, like when he talks about, um, I think it's Yuri, Yuri Nisterov, it's like what's his name, um, is his colleague uh, with whom he um, was like, who was a photographer and he mentioned that he actually had some photo books and he had some magazines and some of them like he would, um, as a friend of him would travel to Moscow to look at the library at the some like Western magazine. And I know that in some interviews like Sasha mentioned that once he went to Kiev to the library to look at some, uh, to some like uh, Western magazines and what photography is. And uh, he came out with some, I think, Swiss magazine from 60s or 70s. And, but I don't think it's like he looked and he take it from, but it was him. Um, it was like he was photographing before he moved to Kiev till 1997. So we're talking about like 1991 to 1997. And he mentioned quite a lot that he photographed it in the table. So he really didn't like published much of this work or didn't like do anything with it. And, and actually he mentioned that in some moments he destroyed also some of the work like or negatives he had. And, um, but for him, when he remembers that moment that he looked at that magazine, he was like, okay, I'm doing right thing. So, and he saw some series of like some b black and white uh, portraiture. And, um, and, um, and I think like, if you look through the through his development of his photography, I think actually a lot of like what we see from nineties, it's more internal, kind of internal, very intuitive photography, which like kind of driven by, and I'm, I'm I would even say that I think for him camera and and um, and a way to work was like kind of to save himself like from what's happening around and like. For him, it was kind of like almost like obsession and like inspiration, something. So it was hold on, actually do not become one of these people who are affected by this like collapse of the system when you cannot get out of it. And, um, and so, and I think like later on, as he moved to Kiev in 1997, became more integrated in photography, like community in Ukraine, more integrated in community, like, like kind of like more like his work started being shown somewhere abroad. Um, he, 
then you can start seeing some more external influence and how he start photographing, how he used techniques and like how he used light and like and how they became much more composed pictures. Shall we talk through some more of the pictures? <clears throat> Would he be working on assignment at this point before he moved to Kyiv? I think this uh, this just his uh, his photographs of his like neighbors and friends. But I think the first it's even not the first assignment. It's just uh, I think it's happened really accidentally. This his first second serious lilies because uh, there was some journalist from Europe and he came to um, took a pictures of uh, in hospital where were people with mental problems. <clears throat> and Sasha came with him as an assistant or like uh, to document all this process. And then while, while this journalist uh, was working, Sasha um, uh, like started to talk with patients, started to make jokes and uh, made with them real strong bond. And he became really interested in these people. And then he, after this journey, he returned to this hospital and he found, uh, as he said, he found just accidentally this plastic lilies. And uh, I don't know why he saw in this plastic flower the symbol of Holy Mother. And uh, he just to decide to photograph all these patients uh, together, all just the portraits in this hospital. And uh, I think it's uh, like uh, a big characteristic of Sasha because he trying to build this bond, this connect with his models. He trying to uh, knew their history and for him as a photographer and f like for human being, he's very interested in human history. He's very interested uh, not like in like picture or photography, but for him, center of his photography is first of all history of, of this model. There's something very important there, isn't, isn't there, about what photography can do around representation and give a voice, um, record uh, people that would otherwise be left out of the, the history books, the photography books. These are ordinary people. Mm -hmm. He sees them as no less important than anyone else. Am I right that this work was also sort of given back to the hospital, these pictures? I think I read somewhere that, but I may be wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> it's okay. But m maybe it could be because, uh, uh, as far as I know, Sasha continued to, like, uh, he... Uh, try to keep these connections with all his models that he worked led years and years ago. And f um, uh, like Emine said that uh, in some stage of his like career, his life, he found uh, that photography could help himself. But I think after that he found this um, photography not only like an artistic medium, but only like as well as a tool to help other people. And I think it will be m more interesting to describe on the next series, how he tried to help other people that like met some problems and he doing this without, with his photography. So this is the Passport series. Could you explain a little bit about how this came about? Yeah, I think there is some uh, interesting story about this um, this series because uh, Sasha was hired as a photographer to photograph people who cannot get to the atelier to get their passport photograph to ta be taken. And in 1994, they were uh, 1995, they were part of, uh, like uh, Soviet passports were replaced by Ukrainian passports. So its passportization is going on, and he was hired as a photographer to take a uh, uh, headshots. Uh, so, um, so he went with these um, like uh, local authorities to these uh, houses of uh, people who cannot pretty much like they. A lot of them were like either bad, 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 
but bed bounded or like were sick and that uh, were quite sick or like disabled. And so he took a photographs and like he took a headshot and he took one of the photograph actually with uh, setting up background for them. So which pretty much capture, captures a, like a social background of this passportization and uh, actually another history moment actually for like uh, for Ukraine and independence of Ukraine. Um, and so, um, and I think like what he said in one of the interviews that because it was a job and like the film was very expensive. So he like did, w wanted to make sure that the photos like look sharp enough and the people like don't have shades on their, uh, their, uh, their faces. So, and he didn't know that you can use a flash like reflecting from the, <laughs> from the wall or something. How oh, he just flashed them straight to their face. And, uh, and that's uh, how this series came out. And I think he never thought about it as a series because it was kind of like uh, a job to do. And then it came out as a series as a kind of when he looked back at his work uh, from before and things like that. And, um, and I also, at uh, one point I wanted to say about that time that Film was so, like, for, for him and for a lot of other photographers, there were two things. Film was expensive, so you cannot just, like, shoot, like, sequences of photos. And another thing, there was this Soviet tradition that you need to capture everything in one photo, like, as a one. And so I, I remember I was in such a house, and we were looking through his, some negatives, and I thought, wow, like, um, he had this series of, like, diptychs, from like cut film, like two two pictures together. And I was like, oh wow, he really found like, I'm like, I'm coming from digital era photography, so you shoot like you, you like you shoot a lot, like so like to make more po points that like you have one photo, which is like night, like works. And I was like, wow, he found these places where he shoot and he shoot and there are two photos together, like kind of between shoots probably. But then I realized, no, he took one shot for every scene. And that's how people, like, so that's how he worked. And I think like a lot of photographers actually worked in, in uh, when you have like really limited like film and you save it, you don't think about like shooting series and sequences and like just choosing like one big photo. Maybe some people had, maybe some people had means to do it as well, but uh, that's one of the things to mention. Yeah, I was going to ask about the, the sort of shift to color photography um, and yeah, the, the obvious sort of economical reasons why for photographers working with analog were, were using black and white. It's much cheaper to, to buy the film, to buy the chemicals, the paper processing, um, color much more complicated, but you've, you've kind of explained um, that that was the case. Was he, was he also taking the pictures for them. So these, these are the pictures of the, um, these are his photographs of the, the pictures being set up, but was he, he was taking the pictures as well? Was there, was, or was there someone else there or the, the actual passport pictures, which aren't part no, of No, he was, so I think they were actually cropped out of, 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 of these. Of these, wow, wow. If I'm not, I I can be mistaken, so please don't. <laughs> but I do believe that they were cropped out, or mm. or maybe there were two shots. It's like I mm. I cannot um, answer to that question actually. Mm. Mm. Okay. Should we have a look at some more pictures? Um, yeah, I think like um, I'll talk a little bit more about Maidan because I was actually at Maidan and photographing at the same time and working at the same time. And we um, hang out, like we were in the same group of uh, people with Sasha at the time. And, um, and um, Sasha is, I think I will say, but Sasha is really like, want to preserve like history. So that is another historical moment was happening at, my, at, at Independence Square in uh, Kiev. And so, and there were like a lot of people. I, I've never seen so many photographers in the square meter as at Maidan, actually. It was like so many, international, local, everyone was going there. And at some point, and if, and if you know, like it was happening over several months. So it started in November and the, actually the shooting happened in uh, 18 to 20, so February of 2014. 
So in some point of this like Maidan growing, it was like looking like a, a, a big celebrations in some point because there were fireplaces, there were coffee, there was like things and it's, uh, it was very innocent in a way as well as a revolution. And, um, and, the, and the protesters, and I think like we also like were part of it in a way that we were there and we also in a way supported it and we were like but at the same time we tried to keep the distance because we like photographers or photojournalists or observers and um and i think like at maidan it was really hard to find a point like how do you photograph people or how do you photograph this scene because a lot of things happening and there were a lot of people doing a lot of stuff and i think sasha actually did it amazingly great and he decided to go with portraits which he is like his main medium but he also quite well as a passport actually captures background but it's very um framed like very neatly framed and um constructed kind of portraits and so you see background even like there are not as much as in passport i think but still like there is like a main character and i think vika like can can um maybe develop this thought because we talked with you about it, how he switched from photographing like more like marginal people to like actually to the people who just happen to be challenging and how the time context changed who these people are. I think we, uh, we spoke uh, a lot about it, uh, about this aspect. Uh, an example of another his serious citizens of Kiev. When the full invasion started, he, Sasha, like starting to shoot uh, like uh, regular Kiev citizens who like afraid of the war. And uh, of course, it's a little bit different of his usual practice because usually, as I mean, I said, we were talking uh, today morning. Uh, like Sasha, he's not looking for pain, as we said today, but he always were interested in people who uh, um, like had some difficulties and were marginalized and was uh, no, um, has not this like connection with society, with has no rights. And uh, in some cases, this series are a little bit different. Uh, but uh, the context is changed, is changing now, and uh, these people who is struggling also a little bit different today because uh, now we can see this uh, all Ukrainian citizens, all, U all Ukrainians, they are struggling from the war, and uh, this shaping make them the like models of photographer Alexander Chekhov. And I think like. To develop the thought, I think like a lot of through nineties to up today, I think a lot of like the the people personage like people he photographed, it's kind of like a people who like if I would describe the they on the edge of the cliff, they are on the existential crisis like not maybe not crisis existential kind of tipping point, and so if in nineties we have like a huge like elements of society who are on this edge of the cliff and like existen uh, 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 on existential cliff i would say and who like society is changing society is breaking and then he goes to like within after like in the end of 90s he actually switches to photographing to the different type of group of people not just people on the streets but like uh, actually like completely homeless people and uh, he has a series of homeless people in Kiev, and he photographs street kids in Odessa, for example, and um, uh, and things. So I think like it also reflects how society changed over that, and what it what did it mean to be on the edge of the cliff. And then with Maidan, it becomes people who protesting, who also pretty much as it turned out were risking their life over there because well, about 100 people died in the result of this shooting on the 19th, like 18th to 20th of February. And then we go to the veterans in between um, 2014 to 2022 and people who live close to the front line. He had a series about um, when he traveled there. 
And then we go to the just regular citizens of Kyiv with invasion, and actually to some politicians and Zelensky as well. It's very much, uh, as the title uh, of this presentation says, it's local, local stories, local histories um, that are also you know, global histories. I've, I do, it does strike me that from very early on, I'm just rewinding a little bit back to um, Eminem, what, what you were saying that um, the, the sort of formal elements of his work, the way he constructs pictures and things, um, I suppose the reason I ask if there was any sort of formal photographic training early on is that they, they, they seem to come from that place, someone who has thought a lot about how pictures are, are constructed and um, formally and, and the kind of symbolic elements and arrangements of a picture. I think you can say that he actually his first job was in photo atelier, right? So it was like taking portraits of people in the atelier. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you cannot like just disregard that. And it's like people who probably were coming to take a pictures of like, I don't know, on the either a wedding, I don't know, like uh, a birthday or, or like to take a picture with kids or like family. So you probably cannot just disregard that. But I also believe that he self-educated himself after he moved. I mean, also after he moved, he lives in Kiev. But it's not just he lives in Kiev. Actually, the society changed. The access to information changed. Internet, like in these years, has like, become like available and stuff. And Sasha is very curious object, uh, a very curious person, and he is interested in all of that stuff. And actually, this is like uh, more uh, look like uh, I don't know, like. Uh, uh, like, uh, I would say that inspiration is some kind of paintings, I mean, a like Renaissance painting. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think maybe Sasha didn't have like a, a structured type of um, education, formal education one, like, okay, this comes from that and that comes from that. But then like, I think like he kind of like takes bits from here and there and he has this like, um, kind of like, I don't know, born talent, right, to see and like just human curiosity and human compassion to the people. And, and so it's coming, I think that's coming from there, Vika, what you, what? I think the same because I think for uh, Sasha, it's more, he's totally self-educated person. It's just his curiosity runs him, but about um, what he feel in this sensitivity to people, I think this series deleted uh, is talking about it a lot because uh, uh, Sasha starts to in I think it uh, the previous series was even earlier because he started to photograph homeless people in Kiev even earlier as 2018 but this series he used uh, really as a tool to help these people because he launch a huge project on his Facebook page when he, where he published these photographs from the street and he wrote stories of these people and uh, also he wrote down the needs of these people and he collected uh, a lot of money for hospitals, for their food, for their, uh, what their, their needs. Uh, he even tried to like help them to find some documents, to find relatives and so on. And uh, I know that he even has some couple of friends that had some shelter and he helped to connect these people with homeless people. So it's it was more and more project that uh, really have this not only power of photography as artistic medium, but he tried to help with his photographer to a lot of people. Um, just to add to it, it's like, I think like also like one of the, <laughs> I might be speculating, but I think one of the, <laughs> the, the sources of his inspiration is actually like atelier photography from the beginning of 20th century. And um, kind of like when people came to take their portraits, like, like whatever, and, uh, and I remember, like, I think, like, in one of these interviews, he said that he really looked at these photos and he kind of, like, wanted to get to the point when you make so much depth into the portrait and so when you can really connect with this person. 
and um, um, that's, I think, what it is. But also about influences, it's, um, I want to also uh, tell something about um, Kharkov School of Photography and this series, actually. Um, because he photographed like quite a lot of homeless people, a lot like, um, I think there were always conversations about like, oh, did he, did he, became influenced by Harkov School of Photography, by Boris Mihailov, but all of that. And um, I know for f <laughs> I know that Sasha didn't haven't seen Boris Mihailov photographs till 2000, pretty much. And he saw it like outside of Ukraine in one of the exhibitions abroad. And he actually, uh, and I think he was not familiar with Harkov School of Photography before like that time. And um, and so if there is a parallel, the parallels probably come from the social context and social surrounding, which pretty much maybe created the same type of like urgency to photograph these things or to communicate about similar um, social issues, rather than like it's being his, him being affected by it, like as a, as a style or like, I don't know, of some kind of a school. It's very interesting that it was that it was that way round. Um, yeah, certainly I think of, I mean, you know, Rembrandt Dutch painting going way back. You know, these these portraits, which have, of course informed the way portrait photographers from the late eighteen hundreds were were thinking about their work too. Um, I'm curious. I wanted to ask a bit about his Sasha's influence on younger generations and and how he's regarded by younger generations there are probably other other people in this room who can answer this question too but what's his what's his reputation amongst contemporary uh, photographers from ukraine generally speaking it's an interesting question um I think his reputation as a strong documentary photographer, I, d I don't want to be like really loud in, in words, but um, um, I think he is inspiration. He is inspiration for many, many, many like. But he, I think he has no any like official followers or s s like he has any school. He has never had any institutions, something like that. But he always was and is one of the most stronger uh, like, uh, photographer in Ukraine. I wondered about that, whether he, he, he had mentored you know, younger photographers or anything like that, if it was, that was something that was of interest to him. Not to my knowledge. Uh, not to my knowledge, but, um, um, but he is very well known as like every Ukrainian photographer who doing any kind of photojournalism or documentary photography and probably in art photography as well all, all of them know who Alexander Chekminov is he is regarded like one of the best current living working photographers in Ukraine and um, and uh, just I think like by just seeing what he does and what he do like and he is in very good relationship with most people so it's uh, I'm sure that this inspires a lot of people and uh, a lot of young people probably was inspired by by the work um, maybe uh, Maybe in more people who work in documentary genre than in the like art photography. And it's through books, publications mainly that people will know his work. Could you say a little bit about, you were speaking earlier about the Donbass book, I think, and the kind of personal uh, sacrifice uh, he went through to produce his first book, which is obviously ext an extremely important way of distributing photographic work. Yeah, that story, like everyone knows that story, that, and, and the myth goes, Sasha sold his apartment to publish his first book, <laughs> but uh, he sold actually the, the property, but it was land, it was not a house. <laughs> um, but he did sell uh, his property and he did sell his digital cameras he owned at the time uh, to pay for production of his first book, which is Donbass. And, um, and um, I want to say, I'm like, I'm not sure I would sell my property to publish the book <laughs> myself. But I think like you should really like, it's probably like reflects on how much he believed on the importance of it and how much he believed in the like, in his photography. And like, I think for, for him, like 
photography is like means so much in his life and it's part of him and he feels like he it's and it, and it's very weird it's not about his ego it's not about like oh my work needs to be but it's more like it's like yes this is part of me this is like it needs to be have a shape and things and um and i think like sasha actually have worry and i think it's why his what his photography is driven from from like this kind of like oh this moment is going to be gone and i need to preserve it and so he really invests in a lot of things like preserving his photography so he did like a, he uh, i know that he's also like when he prints his like some of the prints he printed he like he found like the like very expensive paper like museum like which can like hold the photo for 200 years and it was very important for him so books like also very important for him so it's like can preserve it and actually uh, talking about my work as archival sasha was like didn't have any question why archive is needed he actually did give us photograph right and he's a member of our archive which is um um which is like i mean I mean, and he's right, I agree with him. It's like this work needs to be preserved. This is like his work from 1990, well, pretty much he worked, his work pretty much covers independent Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And his work pretty much covers every stage of like a history of Ukraine. And he's had one famous sitter. <laughs> Could you say a little bit about this portrait, how it came about, maybe it's not that Complicated. It was for Time magazine. It was. I think it was commissioned by Time magazine, and uh, for now, I think it's the most iconic uh, portrait of President Zelensky. And uh, like few months ago, Sasha like sold this photo on the auction and uh, raised uh, like a huge amount of money, and helped with this money to like. Uh, a lot of uh, children hospital in Ukraine. He sold it twice. <laughs> <laughs> he sold it twice for fundraising purposes. Um, and that is also that talks about him quite a lot as a person, right? He instead of like trying to like he doesn't he didn't sell it like to make any money for himself or cover his expenses. He actually all money like went into like one of them for generators, I think like it was during yes for hospitals and it's like and 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 it's the same he like he does a lot of fundraising and he cares about people he photographs he cares about where he lives and he it's it's like and i think it's like you can really see that through his photography but of course like um people change as well but um and about this portrait um and we we discussed it with Vika as well like that uh, actually, quite a lot of photographers made portraits and photographed Zelensky, but I think this one is going into into like as an iconic iconic image of Zelensky, who is also looks very human as a human who is uh, struggling in a way as well with his duties, responsibility, overwhelming duties and overwhelming responsibilities of like being a president of the country which we being in, invaded and like when like everyone around like suffering from military like aggression russian military aggression and i think like that's and it's also like it's very weird like he's not looking down and he's not looking up to him it's very like straight but i think it's also like i think with photography which his previous photography um with his portraits like it's like where you, you never get like that feeling of looking down on the on who he photographs. It's quite quite direct interaction, and um, and I think that that's in particular like makes his for me personally makes it very special photography. <laughs> yeah, you feel like he's photographed Zelensky just as he would photograph any other citizen. There's there's no regalia. He. And like you were saying earlier, there's this kind of uh, intensity of the the sort of gaze, the 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 collaboration with his sitter. He's really trying to to hone in on on the person in the photograph. I mean, it, it's um we can't really say uh, where he's 
going with his work, but I wondered if, could you say a little bit about what Sasha is, is doing now, what the, the pictures he's making now? Have you been in touch with him recently? I know he, um, so Citizens of Kiev were um, also commissioned by New York Times, I believe, New York Times Magazine, uh, but he is continuing, um, uh, he, pretty much what he's doing, he's expanding the series. It's not Citizens of Kiev anymore, but he is taking portraits of uh, of people who survived uh, Russian occupations uh, around Kiev, in particular, like Bucha, Borodyanka, Hostomel, and other towns. And uh, it's uh, it's in similar aesthetic to Citizens of Kiev, actually. And I and I believe he's trying to make a book out of it. And um, and uh, another thing, which is quite different actually for his photographic practice. He is accompanying each photo which he's taking now, like doing this project with a lot of text. It's like he interviewed each person who he photographed, who survived the occupation. And there is like this transcribed and translated interviews, which you don't have like that. It's also some kind of a change. And I think it's probably coming from change that, um, it's just such a horrendous situation in Ukraine with invasion and military aggression. It's almost like feels that you cannot capture just with photograph or a portrait what happened to people and what they lived through, that you almost want to get the, their testimonies about what happened to them. And also, like, it's, it's war crimes. A lot of, like, quite a lot of these cases are war crimes. Of course, some of them do not lay within war crime definition uh, with international legislation, but, or they're not proved, um, but still, like, we're talking about, like, people who survived. And, um, <laughs> and this was interesting. Um, it's, um, it's like Sasha said about these portraits. Oh, what's kind of resilience in these photos, photo, photographs? And he said, they survived. Mm. That is itself an act of resilience. Are we okay? Should we open it up for questions? Um, if anyone would wanted to ask anything. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I got a question. I'm not sure if you have an answer to that, but um, talking about the project that were commissioned by the state initially and then became uh, available for public view to know uh, the process of it. Because I presume if people were photographed for a passport, it's quite a private uh, photography in a way that is not supposed to be public. So may maybe you have an uh, answer to that. I have only speculations. <laughs> But I can speculate, of course, around it. Um, it's 1994, 1995. And I don't think at the time, as country was in mass and everything was in mass. Um, so I think it just, there were no protocol or procedure or like taking these photographs into, into the like kind of making them public or private. Uh, but I think what another thing which is um, probably for sure to say that um, there are probably were no agreement or contract with, from the state to Alexander either. <laughs> I would say it was like, oh, come here, we need photo, we, we need a photographer, do you have camera, come with us. Uh, it was like so, probably like that's more or less the story, but I also probably... Um, probably by the time they became public, probably most of these people were gone, I would say. Uh, well, it's um, a comment and a question maybe, because uh, we as a, as a publishing house, we went through some of the archival materials that uh, Sasha has. And uh, one project that struck me particularly was uh, his, I would say, street photography from uh, Luhansk in the 90s. Do you know something about this project? Can you say a couple of words? Because 
uh, al although, of course, the misery that, that he captured there, because the 90s in, in Luhansk, you can only imagine, uh, it, it looked like, uh, stylistically, it looked like street photography, like, you know, something that became fashionable much later, but uh, nevertheless. I, I just can add that um, it looks like it's street photography, but I think uh, Sasha knew a lot of these people, so it wasn't he was not the regular observer. He knew these people. He like uh, a lot of them were with uh, his like schoolmates or neighbors or something like that. Who so he just captured moments of their life really strange life and in some really painful in some way but he knew all, all this all his models I mean I haven't seen the large takes of this so I, I cannot say what is an archive but um, I think like as a, as a street photography um, I think like the general it's it's hard to call it street photography because like it's actually there are a lot of interaction going on with him through like as a subject at least like if I were talking about the same project <laughs> um, and um, and I think that interaction is visible to the viewer quite right away and I remember like uh, I was I was studying in photo journalism in Ohio University and it was not so long ago like ten years ago like a little bit more than ten and. And the rule of like street photography, no one should see you ever. Like you should be invisible. You should be like just like catching the moment and things like that. And so, and he photographed in Nazis, and it's like very straightforward like interaction. I remember like one of these photographs, which very well known in in, in uh, of this um, sergeant. I was like the police police guy like standing like by the by the. Uh, yeah, and I think like the story behind it is that actually the guy was laying down before and he picked him up and he's like, oh, could you stand there? And, and that's how the photograph was made. And he's, of course, and um, it's very important also to say that in the 90s, Sasha himself was practically living in that photo studio and <laughs> living like, like, not living because he was working. He was living because he was living there. And... Um, and uh, that he also was part of all of this like uh, partying scene. And I know is it correct to say <laughs> partying and like uh, drinking and all of that. It's like he was right part of all of that life he photographed. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think it's changed a lot as he grew as a career and he changed as a person as well, I think. And he's changing change of lifestyle definitely reflects on his photography and how he's doing it. Uh, I want to ask, uh, maybe you can tell us um, about his recognition in uh, Ukraine, because as far as I know, uh, before 2022, there were not so many exhibition, uh, exhibitions of his photography in Ukraine. I think, unfortunately, there is no many photographic exhibition in Ukraine in general. <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, like Sasha, as we said already, he is well-known photographer and he had a lot of books, publications. I think the main question is uh, there is no many like projects like in institutions, in public institutions or private institutions is going on in photography in Ukraine in general because uh, for now it's not the most popular me artistic medium in Ukraine, in Ukraine. So we have a lot of different photographers but uh, we have no like a lot of institutions curators that uh, want to work with photography and research it can you hear me oh yes um my i'd, I'd be interested to know is he a family man yes <laughs> no, he he has uh, he has a daughter, and uh, he's uh, not married to 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 the 
his ex-wife. <laughs> I mean, he he has, <laughs> he, he has ex-wife and he has a daughter, which uh, he is in a very good relationship with his daughter. And he, uh, I met her, Nastya, and she is, I believe, in Slovakia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Slovakia, probably. And she, I think, like actually entered university recently, and uh, and uh, yeah. Why do you ask? <laughs> well, he sounds like um, the kind of photographer who would not spend very much time at home at all, <laughs> <laughs> particularly as his career has advanced. I mean, looking at his later work, it clearly has become more sophisticated. And uh, he has access to, obviously, very high-quality cameras and things like that. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's quite interesting to see how his career has developed, really, and how his visual language has become more sophisticated as he's progressed. As we are slowly moving towards the end of the symposium, this is the last uh, panel. Uh, which uh, will be about the Ukrainian photography uh, during the wartime. Uh, and it will be followed by a short uh, comfort break. Uh, and then we're going to uh, watch a documentary movie uh, entitled Gladelov, about Ukrainian documentary photography Alexander Gladelov. And this won't be uh, available for our online audience who are physically present here. Um, and it's my pleasure to present uh, the last trio <laughs> on the stage, uh, the moderator of this discussion, although I know that you guys decided to do it a little bit differently, so each of you will be presenting. Um, but the moderator is Katrina Radchenko, uh, whom uh, uh, we had a pleasure to hear before today, earlier today, and she's a curator, artist, uh, photographer, uh, which hasn't been mentioned <laughs> earlier, I guess, and the uh, founder and the director of International Festival o Odessa Photo Days. And then we have uh, Katerina Yakavlenka with us, uh, who is a Ukrainian uh, contemporary art researcher, curator, writer, and uh, currently the culture editor, editor in chief of the Ukrainian uh, um, Suspilne. And among her publications is the book uh, Why There Are a Great Woman Artists in Ukrainian Art, published in 2019. Um, and uh, she also publishes quite often on uh, EFLUX, and uh, her pieces are published on EFLUX and uh, Art Forum. And then we have with us uh, Michael Kust, who is a writer, researcher, and curator based in London. Uh, he's a recipient of the 2023 International Awards for Art Criticism uh, First Prize. He also contributes to EFLUX and uh, other uh, publications and magazines like the London magazine Burlington Contemporary Art Review Oxford. And uh, he wrote uh, a piece, and as we learned before, curated uh, an online exhibition on uh, uh, Ukrainian photography's uh, platform. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, this is like uh, our last panel discussion like during the symposium, but also like um, probably uh, the most uh, also quite important uh, because we'll try to discuss how photography actually now changed in uh, Ukraine during the war time, uh, how this transformation going on, and also like how is today already Katya has mentioned that uh, this is could be uh, the beginning of the uh, next symposium because like, it's a really huge topic to discuss and um, as uh, it's in the process, uh, it's really still a lot of questions and it's still like not so much analysis of uh, these changes. So that's why we decided, like three of us, that we are a little bit like uh, change this format, and it will be not the classical moderation. And like three of us will do like um, short presentations and different points of view how the photography changed, uh, especially in Ukraine. Uh, and then we'll uh, try to open the questions and like to try to find the answers all together, like during the conversation. So I will start. 
uh, from my presentation and um, uh, I'll just like uh, uh, wanted like to mention few different directions how the photography changed, and uh, as I mentioned today in the previous uh, talk, that um, when the war starts, uh, not starts but escalated in uh, 2022, uh, it's most of the artists, most of the photographers in Ukraine, they became war photographers, uh, and it was not the decision. And they never had this um, uh, practicing, they never had this knowledge how to behave on the front line, how to behave like during the rocket attacks. They didn't have the equipment uh, needed for this. But uh, it's how it happened that like the uh, just war escalated in the each city, in like the all, f all country. And like while you're living uh, next to this, uh, you're not able to stay and to take the distance. Uh, so they, they have to become the war photographers by then, not that choice but also like uh, it's like we can see uh, like it's like a lot of uh, photographers who actually never did uh, the war images or never did never work in the documentary way now they're mostly focusing on the documentation and also there's another explanation why it's happened because like the uh, situation and daily life change uh, so fast like uh, each day it's something new comes like each day it's like the absolutely like the new adaptation so for the majority of the artists nowadays, it's like really important to uh, make this documentation of these changes and really like to make this personal archive of these changes. So one of the examples is Lena Subac, actually. She is based in Lviv, and uh, uh, before the escalation, she actually did the amazing, um, beautiful, uh, bright uh, on the colors uh, collages and different stories, which was like in the uh, kind of uh, ironic uh, way to show uh, the place where, like the west part of Ukraine, and like this certain series is called Babusia or Grandmothers. So we can see the bright colors. We can see like really how she is captured like different moments of the uh, grandmothers in the west uh, part of Ukraine and their connection to the religion, to the traditions. So, and she's kind of making like, this is like really bright and positive story. But um, yeah, so like this is like different examples. Uh, but like when uh, from uh, 2022, she completely uh, changed her direction and she started to document uh, the, how the city Lviv uh, was changed. Like for example, there was a moment when uh, the uh, different volunteering groups and museums, they started to try to protect the uh, monuments and protect art and uh, protect the architecture. Uh, in Lviv, uh, so they collected like did this um, uh, like s protecting the constructions for the different churches in different uh, places, and um, Lena just documented this. So it was like also like she kept a little bit like her visual language in the case that like she is still using sp uh, flash, she is like uh, trying like still working with the colors, but like it's completely different story nowadays. It's not collages, it's not the humor, it's just documentation of these changes in her city. Uh, yeah, so like this is also like how it was protected in the um, in the museum where she used to work in, in that time, and um, then the next uh, actually like uh, point uh, it's also like uh, it's already mentioned today that like photography as a medium started to be used not only for the documentation but also for the let's say for the reflection and for the also kind of trying to keep your mental health. Uh, and in this case, it's an example of the young uh, student, uh, Katya Alexeyenko, she is 19 years old. She was one of the member of our mentorship program. And actually like she uh, started, like she was interested in photography like uh, before, but like in this case, like uh, she moved from Kram Kramatorsk to Poland. And during the mentorship program, she wanted to do the story of this process, how people from Ukraine, they uh, actually run away from the war. Uh, so she invited uh, different people, mostly of her age, to share their stories and to share images from their phones. And then she created this um, uh, project. And the project is combination of the 
portrait of the heroes, which Katya selected and made these images. The short text from them, uh, she took the interviews, but also the images from the private, uh, like pri private phones. And also, like it's um, interesting to see it from the inner perspective, because like uh, especially the moments when the people try like to uh, escape from the uh, of the war cities on the of the different uh, this moment when it was like absolutely like difficult like to catch the train like to uh, flew from uh, their places like and it was really crucial so like it was like moment of stress and uh, we actually thought that like there's not professional stories about this and only how we can see it it's only from the uh, vernacular photography from the images which were made by the phone so this is like uh, another hero who actually, Maxim, uh, he stayed in Kharkiv and, uh, uh, for a while and uh, he documented the, his district Saltivka on the first days. And this is like also like different perspective uh, how the war is in Ukraine, but like actually nowadays it's absolutely clear that like everyone who has a phone trying to document uh, even like even when it's like during the rocket attacks, it's just another case that like it's uh, not all these materials possible to show and publish, and because like it's also like the question of um, uh, like the time of the publishing of the image that like not to spread the information and not to help for the navigation of the rockets. And um, then another case which I also wanted to mention it's um, uh, photography from the front line. Because also, like uh, to get the permission to come to the front line, it's quite complicated. Like especially if it's an um, active zone, and especially if there's danger for the mass media. So it's uh, in the certain time, it's not possible uh, for the press photographers to receive this permission to go to the front line. So and in this case, like it's um, uh, like what we how we can see what's going on there. It's not only from the professional images, but also again from the vernacular photography from the people who is um, on, like, uh, in the army, like in the front line. And this is like one of the examples. It's a story of um, Maria Lesniak. Actually, she joined voluntarily uh, the Ukrainian army. And before, she was a nurse. So she, is, she doesn't have any connection to the art of photography by, by herself. But like she is documenting. She is using her uh, telephone by documenting of their daily life and the life around her. And this is like just like small preselection of the images, what she did, and she also like um, actually we invited her to be um, part of our uh, program of the reframing my body. So we also interviewed her, but also what is was interesting for us, um, and what I noticed like when she sent it her images, actually she had a lot of selfies, and this is was oh no wait this is was quite interesting moment. Because like, it was like more selfies than the images of the uh, surrounding, and, um, and then I thought like, well, okay, maybe it's like uh, also like selfies by uh, what you're making by yourself for the like I don't know Instagram for the sharing with um, with your family, but then like I found out the another soldier actually who decided to be anonymous, and I found out his images in Twitter. So uh, he is uh, making selfies in the each position where they're staying. So each, just like in the different houses where just they're making the position or where they're staying, uh, he's making the images of himself in the mirror. And then I found out it's quite um, fascinating that like it's so many selfies right now from them. Uh, front line. And um, I talk with the photographers who actually now um, on the front line. And uh, I ask them, what are you doing now? What the images do? Like, uh, do any, like, doing any documentation? And I found out that they also switch to the selfies. And, um, and actually, the selfie nowadays is became one of the uh, act to make yourself alive. One of the act to prove that you are still alive, but also it's an act like to uh, memorizing yourself. Because like selfie, you're like doing for your family or your uh, friends to share when you're sending like these images to them to let them know that you're alive. But also it's a moment for yourself to make this selfie and then like to really like to visualize that you're still alive. And then, like I found out that, like it's also like quite um, interesting transition of photography, especially when we are working on the images from the front line, and it's different 
different view on the war. It's like all these examples, it's like not the showing this classical approach, but like showing completely different from the inner perspective. So this is like, was like my short presentation and like uh, we are slowly moving to the others, other presentations and then we'll have like questions and uh, more, more time to discuss it. So Katya, please. Uh Hi everyone, and uh, I wanted to start with uh, my gratitude to Ukrainian army forces. And now you will see one of the portraits on the next slide of uh, John Object, who is a uh, Ukrainian electronic composer. Could you please turn the lights? Ah, okay, sorry, this is works now. I forgot. Uh, yeah, so this is John Object, and this photography made by <laughs> Sasha Maslov. Um, and this is a part of his huge series of photography of young Ukrainian fighters who are currently on the front line, but also some of them already um, uh, passed away. So he has uh, 200 uh, photography, portrait photography of Ukrainian soldiers. And for me, it's quite important to mention it today because this is... Uh, Exactly on this day, on uh, 5th of March, we killed the very first person uh, by the Russian activist in Donetsk. So this is 22 years old uh, young historian Dmitro Chernyavsky. And this is exact day how we can like start talking about war and what was happening over all these years. And why I sh decide to talk today uh, in a frame of war photography about portraits is that because for these 10 years have been changed a lot for many people and uh, some of them are already um, not alive, uh, but still somehow for photographers and for artists who work with photography, it's become very important to photoshoot everyone everywhere. Uh, and this is... Um, about friends, this is about communities, this is about also how life is changing every day. So each time when you see uh, even the same uh, person, even this, uh, made by the same photographer, you see the difference what was changed. So the next uh, artist is uh, Olya Yeremeyeva, is also super young photographer from uh, Kyiv, and she make this uh, object uh, called family album because she find uh, on the flea, key flea market uh, like old style book called family al album and she was fascinated what was inside but then she come up with the idea that what is about her family because during the war you feel this um, a different perception of intimacy, of how to be close to each other. And for many people who survived and many people who experience everyday bombing and shelling, this uh, perception has been changed. Um, and some people who even don't have connection with you become much closer. So she starts thinking about this uh, idea of being family or like uh, feeling intimacy and being close to each other and um, decide that her uh, family album would be consist from the images from her daily life, uh, spending with her friends and neighbors. So she, uh, as she photoshoot a lot, uh, her personal community um, and streets, uh, so you can find in this album a lot of images of like daily life, uh, birthdays, like how the, do they celebrate life <laughs> during a al alarm um, and um, shelling in Kiev, for example, being in a corridor and hiding from the drones and um, um, missiles. So she um, uh, she did this photo book, uh, and firstly, it was exhibited last year in. Uh, apartment exhibition which are again become somehow super important for local community not because they don't want to be uh, shown uh, in the galleries or museums but this is also gives them more opportunity to be honest with each other and to discuss uh, photography itself more directly and more critically I would say but also to feel somehow support from people who again are uh, right next to you. Uh, so another author is Yaroslav Futimsky, who is 
originally born in very small village in uh, Paninka, Khmelnytsky Oblast, but uh, he started his artistic practice in um, uh, Western Ukraine, and then he moved to Kyiv, and um, this exact Syria he started doing in 2012, and he didn't um, uh, recognize that this is a Syria. For him, it was like a daily life practice to photoshoot um, uh, his friends, uh, his community. He has a lot of connections with musical bands, with ar uh, artists, of course, uh, with um, and he quite good in connections just with the people out of streets. And his method here, so he's shooting for half frame uh, photography camera. So sometimes you even don't expect and you don't know what would be right next to this uh, image. So he, uh, these uh, portraits, this exact uh, Ukrainian volunteers, artists, uh, and now uh, soldiers, um, so everyone who connected to the art scene but then changed their attitude and their daily life because of war. Um, and the um, uh, last uh, artist whom I want to show, this is Katya Buchatska. And this is also very interesting on how she uh, changed, but not changed, maybe grow in her personal practice because Katya worked a lot with photography before and she did a huge exhibition in Malahalareya of Marstetsky Arsenal uh, entitled uh, Photography from last year. Uh, but since full-scale invasion happened, Katya was um, uh, preparing museum in um, ivano frankivsk Oblast to, uh, in honor to photographer Paraska Plitka Horetsvit and museum how to open on 1st March, but of course because of full-scale invasion it didn't happen at that time and she moved to Lviv and then she was, as she is a multimedia artist, she was thinking that maybe this is, sh she will never do artworks anymore because so much more violence outside and it's, it was so difficult to um, resist and to recognize what was happening at the time. And she decided that she will do the last paintings in her life. And then, of course, she was continuing to do mo more and more. But um, one another thing that she was thinking about is that she's doing all the time images on her mobile phone. And she would never post it in the social media or to show anybody because this is too much personal. She cannot hurt anyone with some happiness and some her daily life, which is completely different compared to all people who are suffering on the front line or like who exactly fights. So she was um, keeping all these images in her own archive. And then at the end of the year, she uh, created uh, an art book uh, which called uh, Photography from the Future Year. And her idea is that all of these images that we are hiding now uh, from the eye of uh, everyone else, uh, from like uh, posting it, uh, this is something that you show afterwards as, um, as live, not shadowed by life which um, which you just cannot uh, share with anybody and even b with yourself. Because as I said, uh, sometimes even something very um, ordinary can be, can hurt somebody else. Be like, uh, I don't know, like for example, uh, if someone's house was destroyed, so like seeing uh, a beautiful interior might be uh, very difficult. Uh, so this is uh, her pages from art book, and also she puts uh, uh, dates uh, where it was exactly done. And of course, this art book also has a lot of selfies and portraits by Katya, and also she tries um, somehow reflect how war have been changed for herself, how she was changed uh, as an artist in her practice, but also as a human being, as a person. Thanks. Um, great. So um, I wanted to talk about 
digital technology and how that uh, has impacted the way the war is being fought and how um, that might relate to contemporary photography. Um, I know it's the most digitally networked war in history, um, but that's kind of meeting with a strange kind of old-fashioned trench warfare, um, which I thought was encapsulated in these photos by uh, Konstantin Polishuk. Um, but in terms of the way the image operates during war now with the digital context, um, I think there's a huge shift. Uh, traditionally, war art would be um, a kind of third-person perspective, a representation of the action. Um, and I think now, because of the um, instantaneous distribution and taking of photographs um, by anyone who's got a phone, um, images become part of the action. Um, like, like missiles on a battlefield, they, they operate um, in that way. Um, and this has been written about in the, the context of the war on terror. Um, there's, a, there's a book by W.J.T. Mitchell where he talks about um, images as living things that um, are operative forces in socio-political reality. Um, and I think that's, that's being seen in an even more exaggerated way in the Ukrainian context. Um, there's a series of articles by a historian called Matthew Ford um, from the first few months of the war where he talks about um, the, uh, yeah, the way in which the internet is meaning that media and war are becoming intertwined to a, an extent where they can't be, um, they can't be talked about separately, um, whether it's Zelensky live streaming his speeches directly from his phone or um, people discussing battles in, in real time weeks before events are then reported in the mainstream media um, or, or citizens reporting Russian military locations directly to the front line um, using their phones. Um, so I thought I would talk about how that um, new visual culture is addressed uh, as a kind of archival um, and curatorial issue. Um, and I see that I think photographers and, and uh, art photographers have a role potentially in helping us understand this new context. Um, especially I've, I've observed a reluctance or an, an, an unwillingness among, uh, especially an older generation of uh, thinkers to fully address this new visual culture. I think there's uh, the networked image represents a, a kind of problem for established ways of thinking about um, ideology and imagery. Um, for example, I, I attended a, a lecture by Alfredo Jar last year um, where he discussed, uh, very earnestly discussed the Ukraine war among other things. Um, but he exclusively used what I considered to be a very old fashioned type of photojournalism to illustrate his talk, um, which I thought was indicative potentially of a, a wider problem, um, especially among, I think, probably non-Ukrainian uh, thinkers who are looking for uh, potentially simplified images to encapsulate the conflict. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about a few practices that I think are engaging with uh, this new kind of uh, digital regime of the image. Um, you might recognize this series. Um, it's by Igor Chikachkov, who I, I didn't know he was going to be here today, so he can uh, put his hand up if, if I say something wrong. Um, but this series was taken uh, as he uh, left Kharkiv to the west of Ukraine uh, very early on, I think days after the um, full-scale invasion began, uh, using his iPhone camera uh, as he left on the train and allowing the, uh, the camera to glitch as it struggled to keep up with the movement of the train, producing these panoramic landscapes. Um, and I immediately... Uh, when I saw this series, thought of the kind of iconic war genre uh, that shows refugees um, or, or soldiers or, or prisoners in other cases leaving on trains um, and how this genre encapsulates the kind of old-fashioned type of war imagery where 
uh, the camera is, 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 is stationary on the platform, um, the, the wives and soldiers or prisoners and prison guards flow past uh, and leave the camera behind. Um, in other words, the, the action is separate from the camera. Uh, history is something that's separate from the, the camera. War is separate from the image. Um, and I think that uh, Igor in his series uh, disrupts that divide between camera and action. Um, now the, uh, the photographer or the, the camera uh, joins the train uh, and flows with history. Um, I think the way in which these images encapsulate a kind of motion uh, potentially reflects the sort of ballistic movement of images across networks um, and the very visible digital glitch within these photographs um, reflects the way in which the kind of old regime of the, the crisp, clear chemical surface uh, as a coherent representation of the world is gone somehow. Um, and the Ukrainian landscape becomes like a data scape. Um, and also, as I've been thinking more, more broadly about that there's a sort of giving up of some agency by the photographer. Um, the, the, the photographer is now part of an assemblage um, <coughs> of camera, phone, algorithm, uh, train, um, and how that's also reflective of the, the new kind of visual culture uh, in which uh, the war is being fought. Uh, I thought this was a kind of, uh, had a strange resemblance to this image, which is by a young artist called Ksenia Sherbakova. Uh, and this, uh, <clears throat> uh, this artist also uses a kind of meeting of train travel and mobile phone technology, um, and also left um, her home in the first days of the, Im the invasion. Um, this image is used to illustrate a recording, a live stream recording of the artist walking around <coughs> Lviv where she, she moved. Um, and it's also a kind of uh, stream of consciousness um, reflecting on technology, in, th in this case as a potential way of connecting with others. She talks in the text that accompanies the, the live stream about uh, how it would be great if all of her family and friends could live stream all the time and share their everyday experience. Um, and she talks about, I think she says, join me on this train journey. So that she's, she sees the artwork as a kind of train journey across space. But equally, the recording is mostly muffled and distorted and full of glitches and fuzz. Um, so you, you come away from listening to the recording feeling that the technology is just is a, is as alienating as it is um, a connecting force. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, this is a series of videos um, by Yulia Shibakina, um, which is a kind of diary of her uh, experience of the, the, the war since 2022. Uh, and it uses this format, which is an extremely sharp, uh, fast montage of social media imagery, um, which I think is a format. I've seen other um, series or, or, or works within Ukrainian photography that use a similar format, sort of found material spliced very quickly together. Um, and she then, she then post these, these videos back online on TikTok or YouTube. So it's as if she's taking like an accelerated or extreme version of the flow of images that you receive online and then reintroducing it into that flow, uh, potentially then uh, jolting viewers into a greater sense of awareness of the, the strangeness of that, um, that visual experience, its, its speed and its uh, juxtapositions. Um, in this case, there's a, a poem by Cheslav Milos, which is, uh, was written in Warsaw in 1944 and talks about um, how on the day the world ends, uh, all sorts of normal things will be happening. Um, on the day the world ends, the, a bee will circle a clover. Um, and I think in this context, the poem takes on a new meaning and starts to reflect on the strange way in which uh, war imagery is, is spliced together online with all sorts of other content, uh, 
beauty blogs or, or marketing um, and how the war becomes a kind of a commodity within the attention economy uh, for the companies that run um, social media platforms that we rely on. Um, and lastly, I thought in this particular video, it's interesting that she, uh, she puts footage of herself dancing. I think there's also other people dancing in the videos. Um, and the, these are kind of at normal speed compared to the sharp, fast imagery that, that uh, surround, surround her. Um, I think this relates to the, the, the both of your talks in the sense that, I mean, th this, this, I don't want this to sound like a sort of anti-humanist argument. Um, I think that all of these series are actually very closely engaged with the physical body and its experience of these technologies. Um, and in this case, her kind of very beautiful movements um, seem to reflect some kind of fight for integrity or physical embodied experience within this uh, virtual uh, and very chaotic context. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I had to say. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Actually, uh, you're right that like the war in Ukraine is the most documented and the most recorded uh, nowadays. Like as we we can see, we have uh, a lot of uh, photographers uh, who is coming to Ukraine, but also like uh, through their mobile phones and through the satellites and uh, all this uh, new media technology. But um, so from one side, all this circulation of information it's help for the investigation and for the archivation of the uh, crimes, as we have um, example from the investigation of Bucha and. Uh, so when the like, vernacular uh, images and videos helped a lot, but at the same time, like all like a lot of circulation of the information and visual materials, it's also like the perfect uh, way for make the propaganda and uh, manipulate by the facts and manipulate by the news, which is also we can see a lot of examples um, how it's used against of them. And uh, in your opinion, like uh, is it possible actually like for the general audience, like how? it's possible like to work with all this amount of inf information online especially how it's possible to make this border and to kind of to read was a true story so as uh, fake stories so as manipulation is this any tools how it's possible to work with this I mean I, th I think um, probably not I mean you'd, you'd have to be you have to be extremely active and informed uh, viewer or reader I think to <coughs> to use social media, for example, to get a kind of accurate story. Um, but I think that uh, the multiplicity of, of views that you get within social media in itself, I guess, is, is a kind of truth in comparison to a sort of top-down mainstream media um, or the, just the, the, the sheer amount of, of information crossing vast distances at any time means that people uh, will at least have information from you know their relatives on the front line, I suppose, or which would be um, information that really matters to them. Um, but yeah, no, I I wouldn't have thought that it, it's. Uh, I mean, people are becoming much more like technologically literate, I think, and and learning about um, echo chambers and, and the way that algorithms are manipulating their social media feeds. Um, but I think that the artists I was interested in are sort of almost engaging with that kind of alienation, um, in itself. Um, it's actually an interesting question, but I also think it's not that's true that this war is the most, I mean, this is right, but that this war is most documented one. But this is also because of we already know all of these instruments and we do have all this. This is about access of media and like all even grandmothers, grandfather has uh, have um, phones and they can shoot, right? And this is about, I think, this issue but also like if you will go back to 2014 for example and we will search for images from uh, the front line from that time and perhaps it would be super difficult to find exact image that we wanted to find because of all of this algorithm and also somehow uh, because of 
super huge tons of information. This is just lost in the internet. So the, even in social media, in Instagram, for example, it was a quite popular hashtag uh, at the time um, war in Ukraine, um, where Ukrainian soldiers were posting the images. And this is not existing anymore. So you can try to find it, but it would be super difficult to do it now. So I think that it's really a big challenge to like really um, took all of this information and we had discussion before on this panel about this institu institutionalization, how to like uh, really uh, save and collect all of this information and all that institutions that are carries now uh, and works with the documentation, they are works, but they will again struggle with what they exactly will um, um, keep in archive and how to like uh, uh, systematize systematized all of this information because this is like really tons of um, things which are people uh, collecting now. It's not even only photography, right? And it's not only photography by photographers, but also like for example, uh, archive in Lviv they collect in dreams, and this is also helps to understand some like other angles and issues of the war. So I think. Uh, for one hand, yes, this is like super documented, but on the other hand, we don't know what would be after this war, what will be saved, how we will deal with that. So maybe at the end we will have nothing. So yeah, this is like really a tricky question. Yeah, like it's uh, it's really tricky, like to like to how was we talk about like how to save this uh, information and how to like this bunch of information, how to archive, but also like how to keep the attention. And this is actually also the another of uh, my question, which is like, uh, it's the, the war is already ten years, and um, even like if we're talking about the last two years, we can see how the presentation of the image were presented in the social media. Like for example, now uh, in beginning of 2022, in the social media as a Telegram, we we it was published a lot of um, straight, direct images with the dead bodies and with uh, uh, war crimes. Nowadays, it's pixelization of the bodies. Nowadays, it's like um, a lot of information, like, it, like the, I mean, like the death is hide by the pixels. And, um, and, another, and if from another side, it's also like, uh, we can see that like it less and less uh, publishing in the mass media the information and for photos from the war and we can more and more hear that like the people just tired to see the destroyed houses they're tired to see like the killed people they're tired because like it's kind of repetition of uh, the same scenarios and the question how actually is possible in if it's possible like to keep this attention and how it's possible like, especially when the war is going already so long time and how it's possible to keep this attention from the from the audience, for especially who is not Ukrainians, who is like not belong to the country. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to speak for all non-Ukrainians, um, but uh, I mean, I think I definitely think this kind of project that's reflecting in itself on the way that social media works is really important um, because it does it changes the ways in which op images operate. So that's in itself an important reflection. Um, in terms of the, it's interesting if you think that there's actually just a general fear of images now increasingly, uh, which does make the role of the kind of specialist photographer more important, I, I would think. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, do, do you think that at the start of the war there was a kind of almost a hunger for images and then that sort of, switch suddenly it was yeah it was like on the on the beginning it was uh, yeah it was like the um, it was something new it was something like radical but it was like new for the as for the international audience uh, and because it's the same as for ukrainians like no one except like even thought that it could be so um, in so scale escalation and like this uh, all these crimes which were made um so like of course like it was like the 
search for the images and it was like uh, about like one year Ukraine was on the uh, first pages of the newspapers and the magazines and nowadays it's uh, I can see like that it's less and less attention and I can see that like it's like of course like it's uh, less and less like comes for the first page which is uh, logically going in the like uh, with all the wars like but um, but also in the same like inside Ukraine it's possible like to see how the people like less and less like watching the images uh, of the death and it's also like can be explained but like by the emotionally it's too much and it's like too long but then it's like the same it's still going on and then it's like the case like how it's possible like to to still to talk about this what's going on because otherwise it will be just forgotten like the same as the images from the 2014 um I think like uh, I will like split uh, uh, all of these questions and speaking about media and how to like deal with this attention. I think that in the beginning it was uh, quite clear that soldiers and people like using all these new uh, tools like TikTok, for example, and this is uh, also uh, because of this war is not only physical but also hybrid, and we like fighting on the uh, informational. Uh, layers uh, in the press in uh, social media and internet and like intellectual uh, circles like in, in universities and everywhere else and for um, young generation and why young generation because all of this young generation they are fighting right now this is not only people who are like already lived and like watch a lot in their life but this is like people who just start living their life and uh, this is only one thing that they can do. They were growing with this like social media and technologies. They cannot do anything else. They just like scroll and post, scroll and post. <laughs> so they like doing this even on the front line. And this is the, also the way of how do they talk about themselves. And as you said before, this is about like presence in time and like in space. So it's really important. But also um, your second question was, um, uh, I also wanted to add to this like shadowing images because this is not only Ukrainian case. This happened uh, before with other wars and like other situations, right? And we uh, also like struggling with that because we have so much violence in the images and everyone wanted to share and to like as a um, scream of help. And as, like s when you just don't, you, when you can change the situation, you want to ask for the help, and I think for many people it was the same. So, like, it was a huge case, uh, a year full-scale invasion happened in 2029 when uh, New York Times wrote a huge article about the case of censorship when Instagram uh, shadowed and then deleted post uh, with image of uh, Palestinian mosque. Uh, that was targeted by Israeli, and so they uh, immediately start talking how social media tries to um, uh, to secret the violence. So they, um, at the time, Instagram company like Facebook, uh, they uh, made a post that they apologized because uh, there was uh, the name of this mosque was the same as a terrorist group. So they like change it and uh, this post become available again. But it was a huge discussion in the West how uh, social media are um, trying to avoid such topics and not to talk about war and like just to show some like consumer images and like happy life and so on. So I think that this is because happened the year after in 2022 uh, because of this discussion already was happened and it was a lot of Ukrainian images so we didn't have such deep uh, debates on that B but this is something that like really exists and this um, also touches uh, upon the question of like female body and nudity and so and like many many other things which like history of culture were fighting for and like trying to talk and make it open so I think that this is would be still so how coming up um, but how to like um, keep attention i think that like different kind of events might be helpful and of course 
people are tired, but also I think this is because when you see such images, you have to respond somehow. Uh, this is about responsibility of acting and like doing something for that. Because if you see that that uh, kids from Odessa from like resin bombing, so you have to like do something. You have to like tell somebody or like I don't know to go to donate. And and for many people, this is too um, too difficult because it's. I would. I don't want to say that it's much comfortable to live comfortable life, but this is also about that. Because if you recognize that there is violence and there is someone, exact person who um, uh, conducting this violence, and like in in our case, this is like Russia and all Russian citizens who support that. So you have to act, and this is of course very uncomfortable because in this case you should recognize that. Navalny is not that be best guy in the world, and you have to like also put some uh, responsibility on him, and like all other people who like you saw that might be a good person, but still they're not that good because they still keep in silent about everything what is happening. So I think this is also about responsibility and like acting. Uh, thank you a lot. Unfortunately, we are already uh, out of our time. Uh, I maybe like we can have still like two minutes for one question uh, from the audience. Okay, two. <laughs> um, I think I'm returning with the same question as I asked Katya. Uh, as uh, as we're coming to the end of the symposium, and it seems like we talked about a lot of different kind of photographic practices coming from Ukraine. But somehow, we, um, it seems like researching and curating photography from Ukraine kind of excludes professional photojournalism. And a question for all panelists, why, why do you think we're excluding professional photojournalists from this kind of conversation about war photography or about, about researching and curating photography from Ukraine? Is that, is that partly because as gallery space is reserved for art photography. But in the last two years, as I see my network of photojournalists, they all have been exhibited in different kind of galleries and museum, as I can see. Uh, I actually, I have a question about the ethics of imaging. Um, I've been monitoring, like all these two years, I've been monitoring people's reactions to photography, the war photography. And it seemed to be that there are kind of a two polarizing camps. Um, so some people say we should absolutely not show dead bodies or people suffering, you know, people crying. It's like absolutely unethical. And um, the, the, there's, been, there's, been, there's been a couple of cases that... Uh, uh, people were reacting particularly strongly. If you remember, there was this uh, one moment that uh, when Konstantin Liberov photographed the uh, funeral of a dead soldier, and he photographed the partner of the, f of the soldier who was crying. So people were like really outraged that we should not look at this woman in grief. Uh, and another, and a comparable reaction was to uh, Evgeny Malaletka's photograph of the woman, of the pregnant woman injured. Uh, at Mariupol, because uh, she was, uh, you know, she was in a vulnerable position. She was suffering. She obviously could not give any consent to this photograph, and she ended up, and she died actually, shortly after. But then she ended up in, uh, you know, front pages. But then on the other side, uh, some people say, well, no, we actually should look at this kind of photograph because how, first of all, how, you know, otherwise how would we know that all of this is happening, and uh, what's the, the situation is, gets more complex as the artificial imaging uh, starts circulating. And we have uh, um, you know, images of um, completely fabricated images of like children crying. And some people started saying, well, we actually need to show real people, real children crying because with artificial intelligence, it kind of looks like fake news. And the whole war, you know, looks like fake news. So I would be very curious to uh, to hear your opinion on the on the ethics of imaging, because you kind of touched this topic from the point of view of attention, like how can we grab attention? But like from the point of view of the, the ethics of showing suffering and pain and all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And thank you. Okay, maybe I'll start and I'll be super short. Uh, answering the first question about the documentary photography, uh, I could say that like it's not inclu inclu uh, it's not in <laughs> included <laughs> excluded at all, and uh, like especially like I'm like always like not always but during the last two years I'm showing always um, uh, exhibitions was combining uh, art photography, documentary photography, and vernacular photography. And in this case, it's also like the way to show different approaches. And like I think like here, it was also the case more because like the documentary photography, it's more visible, and it's maybe more on the surface than like different um, art practicing or vernacular photography, which is like less uh, on the talks. So in this case, like it's like much more the case to open up different horizons and different voices. And answering the second question, uh, to be honest, I can't answer this question. Uh, and I will say personally, uh, that personally I left, I was a photojournalist by myself and I left it uh, because of this case, because I was not able to shoot uh, the struggling of others. It was not possible for me. And uh, as a curator and as a um, person, uh, as Ukrainian, I think I want to have a right to see everything, what's going on, and I don't want that someone decided for me what I'm allowed to see or not. Because like um, it's a real life, and we have to accept it. And uh, for me, um, as also in the curatorial way, I'm trying to show how it is uh, because like, I think um, the people have to make their own choice if they wanted to see, if they're not, but they have to have access to this. I agree with uh, everything that Katya said, and I also don't feel that uh, journalism, photojournalism excluded from the scene. And I also like even think that it might be it become more visible now uh, because of um, uh, names and famous images like for example like lots of uh, international exhibitions they are ex include such image uh, images to the exhibitions to art exhibitions but uh, um, like talking about the case of Liberova, I think the issue is was um, also about that she asked everyone not to photo shoot. And this was uh, a core question um, to photographers, why they did it if she asked not to do. So this is also like different from Mal Malaliatka, I think, because he, of course, was recognized as a photographer and she saw, so she can say, that you cannot photo shoot, but yeah, I don't know that exact situation. But in the liber of it was like um, that she refused. Um, Okay, then I don't know because uh, she posted uh, before uh, a post and asked not to do that. So maybe in this personal case, they come to her and ask, but this is exactly what I know, so maybe. So you know answer why you asked us. Uh, I think that there is no like a good answer, like clear answer to this question because I was like from the side of person who who was photoshooted by the photographers during evacuation, and I um, understood that somebody is uh, taking images of me and all of this like crowd and women who are crying and children who are crying, and this was horrible. And of course, I don't want to like be in that pictures. Um, but I also understand that this is uh, a way how to like communicate, but still I think that 
each ethical question is like how to be like seen differently, like it, to asking each person who is for the shooting and what exactly he or she is for the shooting. And uh, yeah, and this is should be somehow received each time because we don't have like clear answer what is ethical in during the war, right? And like. Um, I asked like Konstantin Polishuk before, uh, who was a photographer and become a soldier. And for him, this is one pattern. But for another photographers who come to the front line and who still trying to shoot for them, it's like, it, another point of view. And I think that like a lot of answers they are inside of each person. What kind of the red line for them personally? For Society is perhaps another way how like to deal with that, but we, uh, I think, in the middle of this discussion, not even in the middle, but in the beginning of this discussion. And maybe I'll just add like one sh super short like reply. Like one of the photographer who is now working a lot on the front line, he told me, it's important to shoot everything, but then you have to decide what to publish, and like to shoot everything, and then like lately maybe some of these materials will be crucial for the investigation, for the like for the uh, archive. But like it's really important to shoot everything wh by if you are there. Thank you.